Welcome to another exciting lecture where we plan to apply dynamic concepts that we previously learned, extend them to new applications. Today we'll be discussing the applications to aircraft, launch vehicles, and spacecraft. Here I invite you to pause the video and download a number of resources here that you can find online. In the first uh, reference I recommend is the fluid structure interaction simulations of rocket engine side loads. The next one is an interesting paper that discusses the dynamics in aircraft design engineering. The next one here discusses the design loads for future aircraft. A lot of these references were not discussed in this particular presentation, but are, are great supplementary materials. I also recommend reading the paper that discusses the loads analysis and structural optimization, a parameterized and integrated process. Hereby, I also show you a book that you should purchase. The name of the book is called The Spacecraft Structures. We also have a great NASA handbook paper, a paper that discusses NASA handbook for spacecraft structural dynamics testing. I invite you to look at that if you plan to work in the area of spacecraft structural designs. Finally, I have another PowerPoint presentation that you could also examine. This discusses a structural dynamic analysis in rocket propulsion and launch vehicles. In this particular presentation, I did not draw from all these materials, but they, again, this serve as great background for moving forward. I invite you for in preparation for this lecture to have reviewed the dynamics uh, lecture uh, and the fatigue lecture. Those two lectures are of great importance moving forward. Here's a very interesting uh, cartoon. Here you have uh, two engineers. They're looking at many different kinds of graphs and diagrams. And they discuss that there may be not, not enough people to interpret them. And that's one of the situations we encounter in structural engineering or in aircraft or launch vehicle applications. Sometimes there's so much data that it's very difficult to scour through. So it's important for you to use your intelligence. Pause for a second and look at each diagram or graph and draw conclusions that could be useful in the designs you're working on. I invite you to do that because Sometimes there are hidden gems in the data that you're looking at. Here's an example where um, there could be some information that may be missed. For example, here you see the time domain. And there's a time domain signal that looks quite periodic with nothing more than that. But when you actually do an analysis of this data using uh, FFT, and I want you to Google FFT and kind of study what FFT is about, you're going to find that when I look at the data in the frequency domain and I examine the signal carefully, I find that there are some spikes at particular frequencies, which means that they are not only this dominant periodic frequency, we also have other frequencies that are embedded as small signals within this periodic frequency. So the same signal, which is composed of large sine waves and significantly other sine waves components, um, we can use signal processing to determine that the larger signals are not masking smaller signals that could be of importance. These perhaps, these perhaps smaller signals could be important forcing functions that should be included in an analysis. Here's another example of a time domain data for a vibration of a car engine. And here you have the amplitude in Gs. In the x-axis, you have time. And the time goes from 46 seconds all the way up to 46.05 seconds. If you look at the signal by itself, it's not obvious uh, 
what are the dominant frequencies of the system? But if you perform a fast Fourier transform of this data, we're able to determine discrete events or discrete frequencies at which we see some amplitudes of importance. So FFT can be a very useful tool that's able to convert time domain data into frequency information and that can point to interesting things that could be going on with the data that you have not otherwise known. So why dynamics and why did I cover the signals? Well, um, the signals demonstrate that there are situations where forcing frequencies can exist in, a, in an input. And uh, there could be hidden information within a time signal. You could make a perhaps an approximation that may be incorrect. For example, here you could have thought that this periodic signal is sufficient. I can just approximate this as a sine wave. And by not doing additional filtering, you may have missed these other forcing frequencies hidden in this data. Maybe not in all cases this information is important, but there could be some situations and instances where that could become important. So why dynamics? Uh, we already covered why dynamics, uh, but it, I think it's important to really emphasize that not all structures can be analyzed using static assumptions. And what I mean with that is that you apply loads to the system and then without considering the density of the system or how fast you apply the loads, you calculate the response of the structure as if you were to apply these loads very slowly. Um, but there is a situation here that needs to be considered. Natural frequencies close to the driving frequencies can cause excitations that need to be considered in the assessment. You could have ground motion or external pressure frequencies. These forcing frequencies can then excite the structure and cause dynamic ampli amplifications that can be of concern. Or there are situations where the forcing frequencies are such that it doesn't cause the structure to move much, but if you were to analyze it statically, it would be too conservative. There are several types of analyses that can be considered. We have the quasi-static analyses, the harmonic, the random, the acoustic, the shock, and then the vibration responses. So far, we've covered three kinds of analyses that have been used to analyze the dynamic behavior of structures. We have used the direct time integration procedure to understand the transient response of a structure by solving the equations of motion. And we demonstrated how complex and how expensive that can be. Then from there, we also discussed that every structure has unique model characteristics that can be described by the natural frequencies and mode shapes of the system. These two information together, the mode shapes and their respective frequencies, which perhaps can be viewed as a DNA of the structure, this information can be used to our advantage. And what we did, we took the equations of motion, which are quite complex and are heavily coupled, and we demonstrated by that by using the mode shapes, we can simplify the system. And then not only that, we've, um, we are able to decouple the equations um, in such a way that we have single degrees of freedom systems. They are, have been separated. We also demonstrated we can do reductions by uh, selecting certain number of modes that could be instrumental in the analysis. So those were the things that we discussed, three types of analyses, direct time integration, a model analysis that allows us to extract the frequencies and the mode shapes, and the third kinds of analysis, which is a modal transient solution, which takes into the advantages of the orthogonality properties of mode shapes. And then we also use the reduced set of mode shapes to describe the total motion of the structure. So why dynamics? We can quantify the dynamics characteristics of structures. Uh, it enables us to 
predict the response of structures given the dynamic environments. Excessive vibration can cause excessive deformation. We know that it occurs uh, in various applications, such as if you're sitting in an aircraft and the aircraft goes through severe turbulence, you'll feel severe motion uh, where you're seated at. Uh, you can ha have situations that we'll be discussing later, so to, such as rotor dynamics, where the, there could be some situations where the structure is getting um, vibrated significantly from the fluid mechanics or a rotor balance uh, or rotor imbalance. Vibration can cause structural failure due to high dynamic stresses. We can see that in turbine blades. Uh, or buildings under, under earthquake motion, but there are many other examples we'll be covering. Any structure system undergoing dynamic loadings can respond differently than a system that only goes static loading. That could be good or bad, but we're gonna look at space vehicles and air, airplanes in general. So let's look at aircraft design really quickly and look at the philosophies and where dynamics can come into play. Now, I'm not going to go into an extensive analysis of aircraft in this particular lecture because you, we, we're going to cover mostly launch vehicles and spacecraft. However, I will provide the philosophies involved in here. So how does a typical methodology work from the top down? And I really want to really give you the top level view, and then I'll give you a few methodolog methodologies that exist in looking at the same problem. The structural loads of the system is really what I need to design the system. And that can come from aerodynamic loading from either steady state or unsteady uh, loading conditions. We also have structural dynamic considerations. Like structural dynamics here, for example, could be a situation where you apply an input uh, and the input gets amplified into a motion in the aircraft. These, uh, Loading conditions that could have been amplified could also mean that the loading environments have increased and my structure should be, in it, should be able to be robust to these amplification factors from the dynamic standpoint. For example, if I have an aircraft going through a turbulent environment, I need to make sure the structure can sustain such environments. If I have a structure that goes through very high velocities close to flutter, then I also want the structure to take those loading conditions. Flight mechanics plays a role because the aircraft structure will have a number of control surfaces in the rudders, in the wings, and you really want to be able to make sure your structure can take the, the, the input uh, environments uh, that a pilot may um, uh, input into the controls. Um, from the top level, when uh, we look at uh, other areas of expertise that are involved in the, in the design of aircraft designs, we have uh, the, the wing tends to be one of the most important aspects where we want to make sure uh, that the wing design is, is, is robust. In fact, the wing is what causes the lift of the aircraft. And so we want to make sure that the wing design is appropriate, that the cross section uh, the airfoil, the airfoil shape is, is optimized. And so that's where computational fluid dynamics comes into play and, and is quite important in assessments of how well the wing has been uh, designed. You also have fluid structure interaction algorithms that study the interaction between aeroelastic effects, basically the elasticity effects and the air aerodynamic effects and these two are crucial in ensuring that the structural behavior is is sufficient uh, for for surviving the environments you may see here's a typical methodology for a high maneuver type uh, aircraft you have a loads database and the load database can include a weight database that includes mass distribution, the moment of inertia. You have aerodynamic databases that could be developed from either flight tests, or you can also develop them from uh, computational fluid dynamics. 
these loading environments and these load databases play an important role into defining your load analysis. For example, you can define your VN diagram. And this VN diagram is of importance in the design of aircraft application. The VN diagram is of extreme importance. It provides, uh, V is the airspeed and N is a load factor. The VN diagram plays an important role because it provides a flight envelope and it could include gust considerations. It can also provide important information into the design and sizing of aircraft. We also have span-wise shear loading, bending moments, and torsion. And then we also have the load envelope, which could include maximum loads, critical loads, and so forth. These envelopes will include plots where you're plotting the shear versus moment, shear versus torsion, moment versus torsion. All this information is fed into the sizing process. And the sizing process is going to include a very comprehensive structure analysis of the aircraft, which uh, could use software such as final element software called Nastran, as an example. This type of software will be used to analyze the structural conditions and ensure that you have adequate fatigue, strength, buckling margins. And in fact, you want to also make sure you can meet damage tolerance requirements for that particular aircraft. Here's another typical load methodology for the analysis of uh, aircraft designs. You want to basically set up the model, and this is again pulled up from one of the references, but I think it, it kind of shows the various methodologies that exist in industry and how they all play a role. For example, here, if the structural design did not close, you have to kind of revisit the sizing or you may have to redesign something in the area where it could cause you to go back to the CFD analysis and back into your loads analysis. So, uh, you know, so this, the typical process, again, from the top level view is to define the specs. What is the mission you want to achieve? And that could uh, drive you to come up with uh, some sort of models. And these models will go through extensive wind tunnel testing to define lift coefficients, drag coefficients. You're going to do finite element modeling. You're also going to define the flight envelopes and design speeds and mass configurations about fuel, cargo, passengers. Uh, so you're going to have uh, this types of uh, mission type information that drives the design. And then you're going to do a loads analysis, which could include structural dynamic analysis. And in these cases, you want to uh, account for maneuver gusts, turbulence, uh, hard landings, uh, and special load cases. This kind of loads analysis are going to be driving loading environments into more static type analysis, where um, you're going to then use it for the structural optimization process. Um, this loads analysis is usually post-process to come up with critical loads, like I discussed before, uh, and then that defines a flight envelope that is used back into your structural optimization. If you don't have a good design, then you have to go back and kind of either redesign the shapes uh, and, and come up with a new loads analysis uh, and, and that will uh, help you close the design. Uh, in, a, in, a, in the analysis of aircraft designs, you're typically going to have two types of models. One model is a dynamic model. It tends to be a coarse model that has been reduced um, for the dynamic modeling. This, type of, this kind of modeling can be also called, and it's been, has been referred to stick models. These models calculate the load distribution using stick models and it integrates, uh, it could integrate gear, uh, landing gear models as well. You will choose critical loading conditions based on the maximum fuselage sectional loads and the critical loading conditions are then selected for static force analysis. So again, you may get bending moment as a function of time and at different locations, and then you're going to then drive, based on this information, based on the critical conditions, 
You can then, then define static load cases that are applied through testing and analysis. And the critical loading conditions will be applied statically to a model and it could contain hundreds of load cases. And the idea is to make sure that the sizing is done based on these results. If you have a problem in the design, you may have to go back and change few parameters, which will cause you to uh, have some iterative um, steps. And so a little bit more specifics here, you can see here how uh, you could have stress strain time responses as a function of time. Uh, so the stress strain can vary as a function of time. You can provide various uh, um, bending moments as a function of time and then kind of run your static analysis, which will be a much more comprehensive analysis with all the detailed information. While the dynamic model tends to be coarse, the stress analysis model can be of quite extensive detail. The dynamic loading in lateral gusts can also be considered in this kind of analysis. And so it, it can help drive uh, some of the more additional analysis. So here, say for example, I have analyzed the lateral gust environment. And in the lateral gust environment, I want to understand what is going on stress-wise in this area of the structure. So what I want to do is refine my model so it's good enough for stress analysis. Right now, this could be too coarse for what is needed. But if you do a stress analysis, you can dive deeper into whether you have an issue or not. So you, you, you're going to have various dynamic loading environments in an aircraft. Gust loads, uh, you can have gust loads due to atmospheric disturbance, uh, change in the angle of attack, uh, change in local airspeed. You can have gust changes that could cause a significant amount of aerodynamic forces acting on the airplane. Uh, there's acceleration that can change the load factor significantly. You can have uh, a response that's more like a rigid body response. You can have a steady state response as well, but here we're really discussing gust loads. Uh, the dynamic response can be quite significant due to, and can be amplified due to the airplane flexibility and potentially the gust velocity profile. Landing conditions can also impart dynamic loading, such as level landing. Uh, so you have a situation where you have a hard landing, uh, all three gears in contact. You can have tail down landing where the tail, you have a tail strike down and I invite you to go to YouTube and check out some A380 tests that were done to understand the tail strike behavior. We have the one gear landing, the drift landing and rebound landing. The important consideration here is to understand that there's also non-deterministic vibrations that can cause damage to the electronic equipment aboard. You have during the takeoff environments or even during landing or various phases in flight, you could have potentially damaging environments. So here's the accelerometer or acceleration data as a function of time. Now, a lot of this data has been collected over the years. As you know, we have hundreds of air, aircraft that have flown over the years, and many of them have been have been significantly instrumented to determine uh, envelopes of what kinds of uh, energies you can expect uh, in flight. And so uh, the point I wanna make is that there's, there's this idea of random vibration that I'll be discussing a little bit later on. My point is that this kind of information can be studied to come up with energy levels as a function of frequency that can be of great importance in the analysis of aircraft electronic components. So I want to point out that model valid validation does occur for airplanes. Uh, there's uh, some testing model analysis that takes place to validate the frequencies and in, in, in mode shapes that were determined for a particular airplane. That, that will improve the structural dynamic models of the airplane. Uh, there's been uh, some ideas of using small signal models to quickly and uh, extract 
information about um, the dynamic characteristics characteristics of the aircraft. Linear structural dynamic models of transport airplanes are typically used to represent and predict vibration environments or vibration responses. When you couple these models with aerodynamic models, they can be used to predict floater and either other dynamic loading environments that basically when you have a air elastic uh, behaviors accounted for, it, what you could have is an amplification of the, of the gust or whatever is occurring with the structure. The model can be validated, like I said. The structure is modeled in the test configuration typically, and it could include support systems. It could even include the fuel and the cargo aboard uh, with the landing gear or down. In aircraft dynamics, what I want to talk about is the kinds of vibration environments you can have. So uh, in aircraft dynamics, you could have vibration as, as oscillating, uh, reciprocating, and many other periodic motions can occur. Uh, you can also have uh, frequency and magnitudes that vary with time. They're not predictable and they're not periodic. Those we call vibration, they're random. A vibration as harmonic is potentially one, for example, like the engine is rotating at predict predictable speeds. These uh, predictable, predictable speeds can cause a harmonic input uh, into the structural system. And so this input is, is known and is, 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 is there. Uh, Buffett is a, is a form of vibration environment caused by aerodynamic excitation. It usually is random and is associated typically with turbulence and separating flow, separated flow, airflow. And it may be felt during extension of speed brakes or during air, air turbulence. So in these situations, you will see sometimes that you could encounter a pocket of turbulence and then the wings will vibrate quite significantly. That environment is random and it cannot be, it's not periodic because it's not predictable. Floater is an unstable condition that can occur, and it is a situation where unsteady aerodynamics excite the natural frequencies of the structure as the air flows through, uh, uh, air flows around it. Um, the resulting vibrations can grow quite dramatically and can cause the structures to fail. And there are some examples in the literature that point to this uh, uh, phenomena. Noise is a vibration that excites the air uh, and that can be heard. Uh, so uh, you will see that uh, when the engine is turned on, uh, you will hear the noise. That noise is acting as a vibration input onto the fuselage and it will excite the fuselage. Sometimes if you were to put your hand on any of the plastic components or, or even in the tray in front of you, as the engine has been turned on, you will start feeling some vibration environments. This is primarily caused by noise, uh, but it can also uh, be transmitted from the engine through the actual structure. Uh, I want to point out something very interesting, uh, and I had discussed it very slightly last week, but noise uh, when, uh, is very interesting. When the vibration is harmonic, is going to sound like a musical instrument. And I want to pay, uh, you to pay attention when you aboard an aircraft next time, uh, you will see that uh, as the engine turns on, there's particular frequencies at which um, the noise sounds more like music. And those situations are such that uh, uh, the vibration is harmonic in nature. So, um, so what are some normal and, and abnormal vibrations? So you have aerodynamic mechanical malfunctions. Uh, you could have atmospheric turbulence causing airplane vibrations. And all vibrations have associated frequencies and magnitudes that can be detected. Sometimes they're so small that only the crew can, can know about them. Normal vibration is so that you have a normal airflow going around the surfaces 
and he, it usually results in very low levels of vibration. Usually you can sense some amount of noise, but not significant amount, not significantly enough to be of concern. Each aircraft, I want to point out, has a unique signature of normal vibration. That's, why, that's because every aircraft has a unique mass distribution, a structural stiffness. You know, you're going to have a build-to-build -build variability from one 737 to another. It's not perfectly the same. Um, and so it's important to understand that, that every aircraft has a unique signature. And that also in, uh, includes the engines will have a unique signature. More noticeable is the reaction of the airplane to turbulent air in which the magnitude of the vibration may be larger and can be clearly and visibly felt. Engine operation at some speeds may result in increased vibration because the spooling balance excites the engines and transmits the vibration through the airframe. So not only through noise, but through the airframe. We also have, finally, that the operation of some mechanical components, such as pumps, may be associated with normal noise and vibrations. Very important consideration to keep in mind. Abnormal vib vibration can be most easily identified by sudden no onset of noise uh, or sudden vibrations that are not normal. Um, and some vibrations can be subtle and they're difficult to identify. Uh, but causes could be engine rotor imbalance, so maybe a blade was lost, and so you have significant amount of vibrations due to that. Malfunction of mechanical equipment, and then you have airflow disturbances over uh, outdoors or control surfaces. And that could be like a buildup of ice uh, that does not, uh, is detrimental. Um, that's a, airflow, a potential airflow disturbance that can cause a problem. Floater, uh, like I discussed before, is an instability. It rarely occurs um, because you design for it. And there's extensive amount of analysis and certification tests that you have to perform to make sure that the airplane is free from all floater for all design conditions within the whole envelope, the stability envelope. This envelope extends well beyond normal permissible operating speeds and applies to normal operations as well as failures, malfunctions, and adverse conditions. So it's important to understand if you operate outside of these conditions, flutter will occur, and it may be differentiated from gust environments on, on steady flow because it can occur in smooth air. And so the vibration, ori the vibration really origina originates from the airplane itself rather than from the atmosphere. Very important consideration here. And again, to point out, uh, there are simplified models for the purposes of dynamics, and then much more complex models for the purposes of stress analysis. On the left-hand side, what you see is a dynamic model that has been divided into various sections, and each of these sections are, and, uh, are um, modeled to include the correct mass, and they're simplified enough where you are representing the correct stiffness, but not too detailed where it will bog down the dynamic simulations. These loads, and we call this a loads model, it's a dynamic model, provides a section loads that are then used into a more comprehensive, detailed finite element model. I invite you to read the paper called Structure Analysis for the American Airlines Flight 587 Accident Investigation, Global Analysis. And in this analysis, you're gonna see more detailed analysis of specific components of an aircraft. So now I'm gonna move into the launch and space vehicle analysis. Launch vehicle dynamics uh, is going to have very fa various phases of flight. You're going to have a launch vehicle that's potentially uh, sitting on the path subject to loading conditions from the wind. You could also have a launch vehicle that's getting transported from the manufacturing facility to the launch pad, and the transport loads can also impart loading conditions that can be detrimental. <clears throat> 
There are also phases of flight where you have lift off. Uh, you can have during during the flight events. You're going to have aerodynamics that are involved, and you can have buffet loadings. You also have multiple separation events, and these separation events can be stage separations, ferry separation, and spacecraft separations. There are other types of uh, events such as pogo. We'll discuss this a little bit in 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 very short detail. We will be discussing motor motor burn and combustion, all these events can cause uh, dynamic characteristics uh, that are unique. So we have the steady state accelerations, basically very low varying, the, the rate of loading um, is not large. It's a small, you can apply the loads very sl slowly. We call that quasi-static when you have the steady state types of accelerations. Uh, if you have low frequency vibrations, uh, typically they will be in the, between the 5 to 100 hertz frame. Broadband vibrations are higher frequencies vibrations, and the random vibrations can go up to 2,000 hertz. I'll be discussing that into more detail. We have acoustic loads and shock loads. The loads are transmitted typically to also to the payload. And then you also have acoustic loads that can directly excite the payload surfaces. So here in this plot, I show in the y-axis is the types of uh, accelerations you can have. In the x-axis, you have the frequency range. In the very left here, I'm showing a launch vehicle with a payload attached to the very top. These finite element models can be quite complex and can have millions of degrees of freedom. At the low end of the spectrum of the frequencies, we have quasi-static type behavior. From five hertz to 100 hertz, we have something more of a low frequency type, and we'll be discussing this a little bit more when we discuss couple loads analysis. And then you have the acoustic noise and the shock and also included is the random vibrations. In this uh, table here, I'm showing the liftoff. Liftoff is going to include acoustics, is going to include some amount of low frequency behavior, and then random vibration due to the uh, vibration environments that can also be caused by the engine. We also have the buffet con loading conditions can cause acoustic environments and random vibe, and the separations uh, can cause shock. We'll be discussing that too on how to actually analyze conditions like that. Pogo, which will be discussed a little bit later, includes random vibration and sign vibration. You're gonna also have some amount of low frequency. Low frequency is potentially present through all these uh, times or flight or events. I want to discuss a little bit the transportation loads. Uh, the NASA Handbook 7005 should be downloaded. I invite you to do that. It provides the, trans the transportation limit load factors for which your structure should survive. You have water G loads and you have the longitudinal load, the lateral loads, and the vertical loads. This analysis for transportation should include uh, these uh, uh, plus minus uh, G loads into the model. When the transport is by air, it's been proven that these load factors are sufficient. And when in ground, you're gonna have various types of uh, G loads that should be considered in your analysis. So I invite you to go ahead and check it out uh, this uh, NASA handbook 7005. This handbook provides the dynamic environments that a spacecraft might be exposed to during its service life, from the completion of its manufacturing to the completion of its mission. They, they, they also cover procedures for predicting the dynamic excitations produced by dynamic environments and for predicting the structural responses to dynamic excitations. They also cover dynamic criteria with appropriate margins 
for the design and testing of spacecraft and its components. So I invite you to go ahead and read that handbook, which can be of great value in the design of spacecraft and launch vehicle applications. The launch vehicle dynamics for quasi-static, the, the loads are usually independent of time or very slowly. So the dynamic response of the structure is not quite significant, meaning I can apply these loads in a static way. Combining the static and the low frequency loads into equivalent static loads can be done. And there's a NASA handbook 7004 that goes into those procedures. For your program, NASA may not be the right handbook, but I think what I'm asking you to do is go through this handbook as an educational experience. Quasi-static loading involves steady state accelerations as well. For design purposes, quasi-static loads can become cal calculated or computed by combining both the static and dynamic load contributions. I want to point out examples of quasi-static loading. For example, the pressures within the tank are slowly varying, so those could be applied statically. Um, you can also have slowly varying accelerations. Now, you could have a situation with an attack where you have some sloshing. That sloshing could be uh, occurring at a particular frequency. And in those scenarios, you may have to account for the, uh, uh, those dynamic inputs into the structure as well. Uh, but if you have a slowly varying load, it can typically apply, be applied quasi-statically. So for large vehicle dynamics low frequency, the maximum steady state acceleration in the launch direction occurs at the end of propulsion phase of a rocket stage. I want to point out several situations where you have somewhat of a steady state response. Here you have a maximum steady state acceleration, as you can see here, in these phases, uh, and then over here as well. In these regions, perhaps you can include some amount of uh, you can consider some of this stuff quasi-statically, but then you have to pr probably augment these quasi-static loads with other loads that are occurring during this time uh, that could be driven by um, vibration environments from the aerodynamics, for example. The acceleration is increasing, as you can see here, in each of these uh, regions. For example, here, you have sol solid booster burnout and then you have transonic, and uh, you have increased uh, accelerations until you reach something called the maximum dynamic pressure, and you continue with the liquid booster burnout, and you can see that the acceleration continues to increase, and this is occurring because the mass of the launch vehicle is decreasing, and the thrust is remaining relatively the same, so the acceleration is basically increasing. The vibrations are, that can occur at any of these phases here can be superimposed with the steady state acceleration since these are occurring uh, almost quasi-statically. The lateral steady state accelerations are usually smaller than the acceleration in the launch direction. Here is examples of maximum steady state accelerations that can be seen for various vehicles uh, such as the Orion 4, the 5, the Atlas, the Delta 2, the Pegasus, the Proton. And I, a note here is that depending upon the payload, this can also be impacted. You can see in general, the maximum acceleration is in the 4 or so Gs. The Pegasus went up to 7 to 10 Gs, as you can see here. The lateral steady state acceleration is fairly less than 1G. For pre preliminary design, the load factors that can be used in the launch vehicle design uh, are, are typically, uh, can be performed with the factors provided here. Uh, here for the Atlas, Delta, the Space Transportation System, or STS, and then the Titan IV, you can see examples here 
of the types of load factors that were used in the preliminary design. Uh, for liftoff, for example, for maximum air loads, and then for stage events, such as shutdown events as well, are included. You can see the G quasi static G loads are applied for preliminary design could be quite significant. Uh, here are the applicable fundamental frequencies for those particular launch vehicles uh, for which these G loads were derived. So the point I wanna make here is that the launch vehicle loads are driven by many loads. Uh, as the vehicle approaches and passes through the speed of sound, you're gonna have shock waves form, changing the aerodynamic pressure that act on the vehicle. These loads combined with the static air pressure, the steady winds, you're gonna have wind shears and gust, and then forces that, apply, that are applied to stabilize and steer the booster. So gusts and buffeting can cause low frequency bending vibrations in the booster payload system. And also I wanna point out that the launch vehicle typically is gonna bend like if it was a beam uh, when it's subject to these loading conditions uh, as it's flying through the atmosphere. What I wanna discuss right now uh, is, is associated with what is going on at the low frequency vibration environments. Here, between five to 100 hertz, how to tackle that? And, and why is that? Because those loading environments caused by the low frequency range between zero and five hertz to 100 hertz can be detrimental to the spacecraft behavior. So that's why it's so important to really study uh, that particular aspect. So for that, I'm gonna cover the couple loads analysis. So we wanna make sure the launch vehicle does not fail for manufacturing facilities until it reaches its, until the spacecraft reaches its intended orbit. But first I wanna make sure the launch vehicle can ascend to space uh, and get all the, uh, can correctly uh, have the separations occur correctly uh, and that no failure occurs in any phase of flight. We need to make sure the spacecraft does not fail during transport, during launch vehicle ascent. Note that the launch vehicle is gonna impart dynamic environments into the spacecraft that need to be examined. We also need to make sure that once the spacecraft is on orbit, it can survive the harsh environments in space. Couple of those analyses, it's a dynamic model. And it's a fancy way of saying that I have a launch vehicle model that's quite complex and is coupled in a single model of a dynamic model of a spacecraft. So you have two dynamic models that are coupled together to investigate all the key loads uh, required to assess both the spacecraft itself and the launch vehicle itself. To assess these structures, you probably need a stress model, and you probably wanna go and develop detailed models of these structures uh, to really understand what these dynamic loads are doing to the structure. Note that this couple of those analyses uh, is performed on these dynamic models that will include liftoff conditions all the way through the atmosphere. And so the idea here there is that I have this dynamic model with transient forcing functions applied that allow me to solve these, then I'm gonna to try to solve these equations of motion um, and determine the responses. And the responses uh, will be loads or, acceler or accelerations uh, uh, throughout the system. And then those are used to drive the structural analysis or the stress analysis, which is a much more detailed analysis. The forcing functions that drive the equations of motion are gonna include the thrust, the aerodynamic loads, booster set, and many other situations. Here you have an example of a mode number 18. It's at 2.93 hertz, and you can see the side rocket motor uh, 
here deforming quite a bit. The mode 53 here is a 16.9 hertz, and you can see shapes of the spacecraft. Uh, you can see the mode shapes of the spacecraft for that particular mode. You can have a, a frequency from the launch vehicle uh, interact with the frequency of the spacecraft, and so that interference can cause a dynamic amplification factor. And the idea is to keep those two frequencies separated if you can. The couple of those analyses is quite complex, and my goal here today is not to give an extensive amount of information on that. But I do want to point some a top level view on how we want to gain confidence in how to come up with the launch vehicle and spacecraft vehicle responses using the concepts that we already discussed when we covered model dynamics. I invite you to look at a PowerPoint presentation that was put together by Al Dr. Alvar Cave on the launch vehicle and spacecraft structural dynamic, state of the art and challenges for the future. It was a keynote lecture provided at, at the AAA conference on 10 April, 2013. You may be able to find this information in the open literature. The spacecraft dynamic model and launch vehicle dynamic models needs to be verified. These models are verified independently and then coupled together to then perform a couple systems analysis. Basically, you derive the forcing functions, use this uh, mega super uh, pretty comprehensive dynamic model. And so you combine these two to provide uh, the ability to then perform an analysis. And this provides the, the system responses required to determine whether the structure will fail. The couple of those analyses predicts the responses of the launch vehicle, the payload uh, caused by the quasi-static loads and the dynamic behaviors. It's going to include the engine startup and shutdowns such as thrust. It may include SRB ignitions. You may have blast waves from the solid rocket, solid rocket ignition and overpressure. Uh, you're gonna have liftoff from launch table. Uh, the engine SRBs are gonna generate acoustics and is, there's, there's going to be some amount of self-induced vibrations and thrust transients from this engine, uh, liquid rocket engines and solid rocket motors. You may have also pogo instability. I will cover, I'll cover pogo a little bit later. And then you have resonant burn conditions. I, re I recommend that you go and research this a little bit. But these are side rocket motor pressure oscillations that can be detrimental uh, either to other parts of the structures or to the side rocket motor itself. You can also have the stage and fairing separation load environments. Um, and then you may have pyrotechnics uh, included in that. Aerodynamic loads are an important consideration in the couple loads analyses, and it can include gusts at, tra at transonic environments at max Q, and then buffeting. And not, uh, not to uh, stop there, but we also have internal acoustic modes from side rocket motors disconnected to the pressure disconnected to the pressure oscillations we discussed here. The CLA will account for a number of effects typically. You're going to have the elastic effects, so the flexibility of the structure, uh, and the, sometimes it's going to include the interaction between the fluid and the structure itself. Uh, the sloshing, in the, you're going to include sloshing in the large tanks, which uh, is basically motion of the fluid uh, at a particular frequency within the tank. And that may involve some fluid structure interaction analysis. If you have a solid rocket motor, the propellant burn back could be included. Uh, and this, for the stage tanks, you're gonna have reduced fuel, for example. The CLA could include gimbling and loads generated by the control system, the control authority. Let me discuss a little bit more uh, what is going on in the couple of those analyses? Uh, again, is a very top level view. I think you can get a better view as I go deeper into the subject. But for now, think of couple of those analyses as a spacecraft dynamic model uh, 
a large ve vehicle dynamic model that have been combined for the purposes of developing the responses over time due to forcing functions that come from a variety of sources as it was discussed earlier. And you can imagine these models can be quite complex. And so if you have a spacecraft model that has a vast damping and stiffness information defined, these models can be in the millions of degrees of freedom. But I also have a launch vehicle dynamic model that has mass and stiffness information and that has millions of degrees of freedom. In these two scenarios, we have um, equations that need to be reduced to about two to 200 to 1,000 equations. And for the spacecraft, I have to reduce it to 50 to 500 equations. These reductions are important because I, it, it will be very difficult to keep all the degrees of freedom to perform an extensive amount of dynamic analysis that's computationally expensive. That will include the whole trajectory from liftoff uh, to the, through the atmosphere. And so these equations are reduced in an intelligent manner uh, in a very similar way to what was discussed in the previous lecture when we dis discussed dynamics, where we talked about taking the equations of motion and then utilizing the mode shapes to then uh, basically use the characteristics of the mode shapes to then determine the total deformation as a linear superposition of these mode shapes, uh, where now the amplitudes corresponding to those, those mode shapes are the real unknowns of the system. So in a very similar manner, manner, if I'm able to reduce the system into meaningful equations on either side, on both sides, I can couple this reduced set of equations, and I'll discuss this a little bit later, uh, of an approach that's typically used, I'll couple these equations and now have reduced the number of equations to less than 2,000 compared to millions of degrees of freedom they could have had. That allows me to perform sensitivity studies and it allows me to solve the equations in the time domain or frequency domain in an effective manner. You can solve these equations with the forcing functions applied and then you also want to make sure you have good methodologies that include 12 unique events or more. Uh, and some of these events were discussed here. Pause the video here to kind of memorize or even absorb the information in this chart. This information here, after you solve the equations of motion, provides me the accelerations and deflections. And once I have this information for this, for uh, locations at the spacecraft and launch vehicle, I can recover them at other locations and those loads are then used to drive the designs uh, or to assess the designs from the structural standpoint. Uh, you have more a more comprehensive uh, stress analysis. This kind of information can also drive uh, testing as well. I want to discuss the amount of effort that we're talking about here, but this is a tremendous amount of effort, maybe more than 40%. Coming up with forcing functions and information to drive the equations of motion 40%, and then the post-processing probably in the order of 20%. Now, this could vary all over the place, uh, but uh, what we really want to make sure is that we have validated spacecraft and launch vehicle models to really gain confidence in the results we're getting here at the end. And so the couple of those analysis output uh, can be either in the time domain or frequency domain. It can provide launch vehicle and spacecraft interface acceleration. So right, right at the interface where uh, the launch vehicle and spacecraft are connected. Uh, it can provide equivalent accelerations for static analyses. Uh, it, can improve, it can also provide internal responses such as accelerations, deflections, forces, and stresses. These results are really used to design or verify the launch vehicle design, and they can drive qualification test plans. It can be used to make sure that the payload does not affect the behavior of the launch vehicle or its stability, and vice versa. Uh, 
Here is an example of a dynamic model for a particular vehicle. You can see it's coarse, but it has a general geometry and it's going to have a good, it, it needs to be accurate in terms of mass and stiffness. Otherwise, your mode shapes and frequencies will be off. We'll be discussing this in upcoming detail. Here's an example of a solid rocket motor uh, with the propellant burn back uh, to some extent. And here's the fairing for this particular solid rocket motor, uh, but you can see the coarse mesh there for it. Uh, here is a, uh, a model of a fine element model. Uh, trying to demonstrate that when you have all these loads applied, it does produce a uh, some sort of acceleration versus time information that could be useful for then understanding the loads in the vehicle, uh, which can then drive the design or can be used to assess the design. Okay. I'm going to continue here trying to revisit. Um, what is required for making sure your spacecraft model correlates very well with test data? We're going to find very soon that it's important to have a great spacecraft model. If there are errors, then that can turn into uh, quite uh, impacting, it can impact the spacecraft loads quite severely. So we want to make sure we have good models. So let's go back and revisit uh, mode chips for a simply supported plate. As you recall, a structure is going to have unique DNA characteristics, dynamics that, that can be characterized by the frequencies and mode shapes. And we re recall that natural frequencies is the number of cycles uh, per second of vibration at that per particular mode shape. So if I were to vibrate it at, per at a particular uh, frequency, it's going to take that, mode, that shape, okay? And so these shapes are the fundamental shapes of the, of the structure. There's supposed to be infinite number of them because we use finite element models. We have discretized uh, the equation. So therefore we have truncated the number. We have basically made the number of mode shapes finite along with their frequencies. Here is the fundamental frequency of this simply supported plate. And uh, there are six of them as an example. Notice that these mode shapes are, are of arbitrary amplitude, and along with the frequencies of, of the plate, these represent the dynamic characteristics of the plate. One of the things that we wanted to do is get creative here. We found that solving a whole rocket, which is made up of millions of degrees of freedom, and trying to solve the equations of motions for the whole rocket from lift up through the atmosphere is, is com completely uh, inefficient and is quite expensive computationally and maybe uh, prohibitive, maybe it's not possible uh, with the computational tools that we have today or the numerical, um, perhaps if you paralyze a bunch of computers, you could, you could get there, but there is an effective way to do this uh, and that's, to look at the model characteristics of the structure. What if the total deflections can be uh, found as a linear combination of these mode shapes? So what if the total deflections of the system can be found by combining these mode shapes and that I just need a little bit of this, a little bit of this, a little bit of that and add up uh, these, these responses to get a total response and so that's exactly what we're talking about here. You have this coefficient here that's unknown. It's an amplitude to the mode shape, an amplitude to the mode shape. And with the mode shape is known, you can find that, is the amplitudes that we do not know. And so by doing so, I've simplified the problem at finding just the amplitudes, given that the mode shapes are known. And so we have here the matrix of shape functions uh, or mode shapes. And then A is the amplitude that are uh, unknown. But in, perhaps we're interested in a couple of those analyses. We're really interested in behaviors below 100 hertz. And so that's important consideration um, because that will truncate the space of frequencies and motions that I really need. 
uh, recall if I have a, a system, a finite element model and spacecraft, there are millions of degrees of freedom. I'm going to get millions of frequencies and mode shapes, and they're going to go all the way to maybe even 10,000 to, to uh, a high, very high frequency in, uh, information that I don't really need for these couple of those analyses, which is what's going to drive um, potential failures in the system. What we did was quite clever. We, we took this information here and plugged it into the equations of motion and then pre-multiplied it by the mode shapes uh, like that. And what we found is that by doing so, we were able to achieve a mathematical miracle. Um, and the mathematical miracle is that we actually end up with decoupled uh, equations like this, a bunch of single uh, degree of freedom equations. And that's because when you multi pre-multiply by phi transpose, it can be proven that this multiplication here turns into a diagonal. In other words, it has orthogonality, orthogonality properties uh, such as this. Uh, uh, like you, you can see here, basically the off diagonal terms is zero and the diagonal terms will be non-zero value, the actual mass. The same thing happens with the stiffness matrix. So this is a very, very important consideration because I'm going to come back to this later uh, or very soon to demonstrate that this information can actually be used to our, our advantage. So consider here a spacecraft, and the spacecraft that's been considered comes from a paper that's here in the bottom right. The paper's name is Robustness of the Orthogonality Checks on a Satellite FEM Using the Syrup Test Analysis Model. I invite you to look at this paper because it provides the blueprint on how you could perform these kinds of modeling uh, validations. One of the things we want to make sure is that the spacecraft model is, is, is of good quality. We want to make sure it can represent the mode ships correctly. If I have the wrong mode ships, perhaps the launch vehicle is going to drive the wrong mode ships and frequencies. It's very important to understand that the mode shapes here need to be accurate to be able to get good responses, okay? So that, that's something I want, I want you to keep in mind as we go through this uh, lecture today. The, space, the spacecraft final model has over thousands of degrees of freedom. Uh, and we're interested in most shapes and frequencies below 100 hertz. That's because these are the frequencies that can interact with the low frequency environments uh, from the launch vehicle side. So what we really want to do is to verify these models by keying on the dynamic characteristics of the spacecraft model. And what I want to do is to validate that against model test data. So I want to be able to shake this spacecraft and then get the mode shapes from the testing and then compare them with the mode shapes that I get from my analysis. We can simulate the transient dynamic response using a truncated set of modes. We already discussed that in the previous lecture, and perhaps you're already going through the project to demonstrate this can be done very successfully, and that the results you get from a truncated transient model dynamic analysis will give you very similar response to the direct time integration. I invite you to look at the link in the description of this video, because I provide a YouTube video that walks you through an abacus model that compares the dynamic time integration with a truncated set of modes using the model dynamic transient analysis, which is computationally cheaper. And I'll demonstrate through that tutorial that you get very similar results. So, in other words, the model characteristics are of importance here. Um, typical modeling errors have to be taken care of. For example, the mass properties should be correct 
You want to have the right units in the structure. You want to make sure that the boundary conditions and the connection points are correct. That you have the right mesh, the right CAD model, the right holes in the right place. That the composite materials have the right ply angles and the ply thicknesses are correct. You also want to make sure that you don't have unintended disconnected features in your spacecraft model. One way to verify that is to ground your model and then apply a 1G load in various directions to look for disconnected features. You also want to make sure that the connections are appropriately representing the stiffness of the connection. So if you have two panels connected by brackets, you want to make sure that those brackets, the modeling of those brackets completely represent the stiffness behavior of those two panels coming together correctly. If you have any tanks or masses attached, you want to make sure that the masses of those attachments are correct and that the mass simulators they could have are having appropriately modeled into the finite element model. We also want to make sure that you have checked the material properties throughout uh, this model to ensure that you're not missing something that's critical. Even when you make sure that all that stuff is up to sniff and it's great and it's in good shape, it's still very challenging to get it to match to test data. One potential approach to get the most shapes from a test is to shake this satellite, the spacecraft, in a table by sweeping through a sign input. And the sign input is going to have varying frequencies that uh, will increase in frequency. And the idea is to induce vibrations in the, in the spacecraft that for example, when I sweep through 65 hertz uh, with very small amplitudes of vibration, I can get mode shapes measured through this test. Now, these mode shapes are going to be uh, of finite response, unlike the analysis of a spacecraft um, here, because this is going to uh, give you infinite or is going to give you arbitrary um, mode shapes in a finite model. You don't get that in the test environment because in the test environment, you do have some amount of damping. And then you also have a forcing function being applied. So spacecraft model correlation is of extreme importance. It allows for the model uh, identification of natural frequencies and mode shapes. You can uh, have a dedicated model test equipment that is really used to to, to produce the disturbance into the model, and then you can record the motions using accelerometers. You can do it through um, a shaker and uh, hammers. Uh, but the idea is that you can get the frequency response and mode shifts and you can compare them with the finite element model. Uh, the end results from the testing are the various natural frequencies from the test, the mode shifts, and the impedance data of the structure. These data are identified from digitized input signals using curve fitting routines that are quite efficient. So I want to point out that the mode shapes may not match the model. One possibility is that accelerometers that are in this system have been uh, uh, inadequately located compared to where the, it's in the model. Or the accelerometer orientations in this location, in this spacecraft, have been misoriented compared to how you're measuring them in the model. So again, it's important to pay attention to detail, especially binary conditions and stuff like that. Now recall, going back here, that if I take the mode shapes, so recall that this is the equations of motion, I pre-multiplied by phi transpose, which is the matrix of mode shapes that has been reduced. I'm only using the reduced set, uh, I showed you that this multiplication here is, ortho, uh, is going to have orthogonality properties, meaning off diagonal terms will give you zero, diagonal terms will give you a value. So I'm going to use this uh, orthogonality properties to our advantage. And the idea here is that um, 
a good finite element model for dynamics is acceptable if I'm able to get my model to match the model test data. So the model analysis um, can, be, can be found, uh, for example, for the system under consideration. Uh, it can be found by performing model testing and by installing accelerometers. So here, uh, the figures were taken from this website. Um, and here is what you have a system here with numbering that corresponds to the locations of the accelerometers. The, the calculations are then performed using finite element models as well. And what we want to do is compare the model behavior at these sites, these nodal sites, with the finite element model. What I want to do is to compare the model response from FEA to the testing by doing this multiplication. So notice here, if I replace phi test with phi FEM, that this should give me off diagonal terms there are zero and only diagonal terms. But the minute that I put this phi as a test, meaning I have the mode shapes from the finite model, the mass from the finite model, and I replace this phi instead of FEM, so I get the mass, diagonal mass values, I substitute this phi with the, mass, the, the, the mode shapes from the testing. If I put that in there instead, then this multiplication better give me M if I have a good model. Uh, if these results uh, give me diagonal metrics, then the mode shapes from the final model compares well with the mode shapes measured in test. This idea here is called a cross orthogonality check. However, it's unlikely that this multiplication will give me, give me diagonal terms only. That's because there's always gonna be some amount of error between the model and the test, the geometry, even if you had the perfect geometry, the as-built condition of the panels and everything else and the clearances and stacking, uh, and the stacking of the tolerances uh, can be sufficient to still cause a difference between the analysis and the test. So in this case, the calculated and measured frequencies were in agreement. Uh, the mode shifts were not really checked, uh, but you can see here that these are the measured frequencies and the calculated frequencies. And here you can see some of the mode shapes, but you can see that in general, uh, you have good agreement between the analysis and the test measured. Uh, so the cross orthogonality check again is looking at the mode shapes from the final model. The, you have the mass matrix from the final model. You're going to multiply by the, um, shape function, not the shape function, but the mode shapes from the test, and that will give you, uh, has to give you a diagonal mass matrix. In a perfect reduction, in a perfect reduction, the diagonal values of the orthogonal, this orthogonalization and cross orthogonalization have the value of unity. So you have to have a 1.0 there if you have, if phi test is, FEM. This better be a one. And that means that the mode shapes in this case have been mass uh, normalized. Uh, recall that the mode shapes are arbitrary in amplitude. I can, I can normalize them by the maximum deflections, but can, but can I also normalize them based on mass normalization? And so if you do that, then this multiplication here with phi FEM, uh, this is mode shape, this mode shape matrix, this multiplication better give me a diagonal of 1.0. So usually this multiplication is a good, if you have a model correlation that's good, if the diagonal terms are greater than 0.9 and off diagonal terms are less than 0.1. Eigenfrequencies have to be less than three to 5%. Uh, if you look at a particular document that's for public release, uh, and it's the SMC-S-004. Why don't you pass the video in a, for a second right now and pull it up? And, and let's go through that together. You can see here that we have a document called SMC-S04. 
and then it's approved for public release. So I invite you to go through that. And it talks about um, the dynamic loss analysis procedure. And it provides quite a bit of information. It shows a load cycle process. Uh, some of that we discussed at a very top level view. It provides background information. And then it provides the dynamic loads analysis procedure, the dynamic characteristics of the spacecraft, the dynamic interaction of the spacecraft and launch vehicle. And then it talks about the external applied loading conditions, which again can account for ignition over pressure, ground winds, launch pad interface forces, aerodynamic disturbances, static aer elastic loading, atmospheric turbulence, and buffet. So uh, these documents go also, also through extensive details into the integration of structural dynamic models and spacecraft launch vehicles, the generation of each flight event, and the calculation of the structural dynamic responses at the integrated level for each of the flight events uh, by applying the appropriate forcing functions. And you will also see that it talks about the determination of structural loads from calculated responses. Uh, in this document, it also provides criteria for good model correlation. You will see here that it provides a, a mod survey test criteria, and here they would like you to find the modes within the frequency range of interest, typically up to 70 hertz. In the presentation, I was talking about 100 hertz, but you want to identify and measure them. You want to basically get the first two lateral modes, uh, the first axial mode, the first torsional mode, and you want to be able to measure them irrespective of their frequencies. Uh, you also want to make sure that you can judge uh, the quality of the information by making sure that the off-diagonal terms of the unit normalized generalized mass matrix that we just discussed is less than 0.1. So satisfying this goal not only increases confidence in the motions, but also increases confidence in the dynamic model mass matrix. You also have a criteria uh, on how to uh, compare to mode shapes uh, as well. So I invite you to look at that as well. Uh, and this document goes through extensive details on the management procedures for identification of mode shapes and the independent load analysis. So uh, I, I invite you to go through this document. There's a, a number of documents here that were published by Dr. Alvar Klaib. We also have Fleming and uh, many others. So feel free to pause the video and download this document and go through extensive detail. Welcome back from reading the SMC S04 as I requested. Uh, bottom line is that this multiplication uh, is, is actually very clever. I'm taking the most shifts from the test, the most shifts from the finite element analysis, recognizing that if the mass has been unit normalized, that if this phi was perfectly matching the mode shifts from the final model, this will be giving me a value of one. But in this case, we, put, we replaced this with phi test, and my goal is to get as close to one as possible, and if I did, I did a good job. Here is an example that demonstrates how the cross orthogonality check is done between the finite element, finite element and the test. So here you have, in the first column, uh, the testing, and then you have the finite element. And then you have the mode shifts being described by the frequencies, and then also you have the finite element model giving you as well frequencies information. And the comparisons are given. And in general, it shows you also how did I do with the cross ortho, meaning how am I, how am I doing when I look at uh, the off diagonal terms, and the diagonal terms. And so what I'm looking for is really good correlation uh, between the model and the test. That's, that's my goal. And you can see that a lot of these modes are not in good shape. 
but you know, doesn't matter because this is above 100 hertz perhaps. But what I really want to do is have a good behavior below 100 hertz. That's, that's the ideal scenario. So a couple of those analysis. Going back, I want to have a validated spacecraft dynamic model. Let's call it verified for this hypothetical, hypothetical example. Um, and so now the, the idea is to verify the launch vehicle dynamic model. And then I want to then couple these two models into a coupled systems model. Then I'll then drive forcing functions that will drive uh, the results uh, that are then used to determine the, 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 the structural integrity of the, the, the vehicle with high level of confidence. Typically, you're looking to come up with the 9990 loads, basically the envelope uh, that tells you that 99% of the time you'll not exceed that load with 90% confidence. You're enveloped by that particular load with high confidence. That's our goal, to come up with those loads, make sure that our structures are safe based on those environments. I invite you now to pause the video again and download the paper that's called Aries 1X Launch Vehicle Model Test Overview. We also invite you to download a paper that talks about Aries 1X Launch Vehicle Model Test Measurements and Data Quality Assessments. These two papers are going to be helpful in our next conversations. Here is a mode vehicle analysis. We want to make sure that the mode shapes are accurate in the free free condition, but also when they're in the mobile launch platform. And so you can see here the frequencies tend to be fairly small. Uh, again, these are Aries 1X, and you can see here uh, one of the bending modes. Here's the first bending mode, the second bending mode, the third bending mode, and the fourth bending mode. You also have the bending modes in the free free configuration. One of the things I want to point out is that somehow you have to verify that these mode shapes are good. Just like we did with the spacecraft model, I want to make sure that the mode shapes uh, are, are, are good for the finite element model of the launch vehicle. And so here is an example of a shaker that applies a loading condition to this section uh, of the vehicle. The finite element model will give you some pre-test predictions for the frequencies and mode shapes. It will include some amount of uh, um, uh, model identification, like first bending mode, second bending mode, and so forth. The idea then is compare the mode shapes from an instrumented, instrumented test article, which has accelerometers installed, and I'm shaking it, I want to compare the mode shapes that I get from this test to the model frequencies that were predicted. And the idea again is that when I compare and I look at the diagonal terms, I want to make sure that these are close to one and that the off diagonal terms are close to zero. You will see that as I go higher and higher in frequency, that becomes harder to do. And that has to do because with the, the models are not uh, very accurate for high frequencies, especially because these models are coarse and you have made some modeling simplifications. But the idea is to get as many modes are, as possible, not only the frequencies, but the mode shapes as close as possible to the test. Here's another uh, section of the vehicle for which a shaker has been applied as a loading condition here. And this section has been instrumented with accelerometers. And on the right hand side, I'm demonstrating the mode shapes that were found through a finite element model. Notice how it's a coarse model and it has some ma main features of the structure. You can see here how, again, uh, you want to compare the test to the modeling predictions. And the idea here is to have uh, as close as diagonal. Uh, as you can with values close to 1.04 or 
the mass the unit mass uh, normalized matrix then you can go even further and take a flight test vehicle and apply shaker loading conditions and then determine the molar correlation for the whole vehicle and then again the idea is to have as many modes as possible uh, for which uh, the model matches the test and so you go higher and higher into frequencies uh, the off diagonal terms may be polluted because it's not that easy to get your models to match 100%. So the idea is to get your models fixed good enough where you can have high confidence in the predictions uh, from, the, uh, uh, from solving the equations of motions. Um, and, and so that's really the goal there. And so then this now has been verified and now my goal now is to combine these two models into a couple of loss analyses, into a couple system model. Uh, and that is not simple. That is not simple because this could be millions of degrees of freedom. There's millions of degrees of freedom. I want to be able to reduce these models and then connect them and then use them for these types of analysis. And so this also could be called stick models in some cases. So for accurately and efficiently performing a couple of those analyses, or from now on, I'll be calling it the CLA, we require a number of methods. One method is called model synthesis, which is nothing more than stating to you that we're reducing the equations of the number of equations. And we're doing so by uh, uh, really looking at the mo model uh, characteristics. Remember, that the key ingredient for the deformation of a structure is that it's made up of a linear combination of mode shapes with corresponding amplitudes. Perhaps it has a lot of mode one, but very little of mode two, uh, and so forth. We also have to make sure that we have a way of outputting uh, stresses and recovery uh, at physical responses. If we work in the model space where we're using mode shapes, we have to be able to go back and look at the physical uh, locations and then output the data at those locations because that's what's going to be used potentially in a stress analysis. So a couple of those analyses requires uh, a lot of bookkeeping, reduction techniques. Um, the models are reduced and coupled. Uh, we're going to transform the equations, uh, use these equations of motion. Uh, for the whole coupled system, and then we we'll apply the, the forcing function to this reduced system, and then drive the equations or from lift off and look at different flat events with the idea that we'll then um, uh, find the responses, bring them back from the model space to the physical space. And when I say that, when I say model space to physical space, let me bring you back to what I mean there. Uh, recall that this is the deformation uh, of the real deformation of the structure. Phi is the mode shapes and A is the amplitude. So <clears throat> when I say model shape to physical shape is this right here, this transformation from model shape to the actual shape of the structure. Very important consideration. Sorry for going back and forth. Just wanted to point that out to you. So the, Greg ba the, the Craig Bampton reduction technique is the primary technique used for these reduction techniques. And I'm not going to ask you to become an expert suddenly in the reduction of the Craig, uh, in the reduction of finite, finite element models using the Craig Bampton method. But I want to give you a top level view so you understand what's going on at the very least. Number one, I want you to pause the video again and download these two papers, the one is a NASA TM 1003 581. 103 581 is called Couple Dose Analysis for the Space Shuttle Payloads. And the second paper is called The Primer on Craig Pam Bampton Method An Introduction to Boundary Node Functions, Base Shake Analysis, Load Transformation Matrices, and Model Synthesis, and much more. So, we, what we really want to do is to, there are situations why you want to uh, have a reduced Craig Bampton model. Perhaps you want to transmit your spacecraft model 
to a launch vehicle organization, but you don't want to reveal the secret sauce to your spacecraft. So in those scenarios, you may want to take your model and reduce it so that it couples with the launch vehicle model at the boundaries. So here's model A and model B, and this is the interface, uh, that's the boundary, and these are the interior nodes. Perhaps I can reduce the model to these boundaries and not provide the whole model to the launch vehicle provider. The Craig Bampton model can be powerful for, for base shake analysis in which the motion of the boundary degrees of freedom is specified for a model from the couple of those analyses. And it allows you not to have to redo the CLA analysis, the couple of those analyses. Uh, you don't have to do that. You can uh, just reduce the model and then do a base shake analysis uh, without having to repeat the CLA. You can also uh, reduce the model uh, to couple the systems together for an efficient analysis of the combined structure as it was discussed earlier, which is our goal is to couple a launch vehicle to the spacecraft. There's a, the, the, the primary paper that you should also download is the original paper, uh, Craig Bampton, heavily used in the aerospace industry to reduce dynamic models for efficiency purposes. Again, you're doing this for efficiency. Uh, there's no need to do that if you don't care about efficiency. The paper is called The Coupling of Substructures for Dynamic Analysis. Um, and it does provide a method for reducing the size of a finite element model. And the idea is it combines motion of boundary points with modes of the structure, assuming that the boundary points are actually held fixed. That's a, one of the assumptions. So let me give an example. If you have a 10,000 degree of freedom spacecraft models up to 50 hertz and 10 modes, um, I can actually reduce a model to 16 degrees of freedom at a single boundary node. Um, uh, and, and that you can see that's a significant reduction right there. Let me go through the theory like in, in two pages, but not more, more than that, because I don't want to distract you uh, from the rest of today's lecture, but say you have the equations of motion and we ignore damping for a second. These are equations of motions that we've been discussing for a long time, where UA is the physical deflections of the system. And I'm gonna take UA and represent that. Uh, and again, this mass times acceleration plus the stiffness of the system times the deflections equals the forcing function for maybe different time events. And so let's take these deflections UA and divide them into two. And on the top, we have the boundary degrees of freedom. In the bottom, I have the internal degrees of freedom. Uh, I probably want to get rid of these ones. And uh, the way to do that is to use the Craig Banton transformation matrix, which is here. Uh, think of these phi r as a rigid body vectors. And these are the fixed base mode shapes. Like if you were to fix at those boundaries, phi L becomes the fixed base mode shapes correspond to that. Uh, and this multiplied by UB, here is the boundary degrees of freedom. And then here is a modal degrees of freedom. Notice how I have taken uh, the internal degrees of freedom and converted, converted to the modal space uh, in this manner. Uh, remember, Q are those amplitudes that I don't know that multiply the mode shapes. That's exactly what's going on here. Look, UL equals VR times UB plus UL times Q. Here, clearly, uh, these mode shapes are, uh, um, are driving the, or describe the characteristics, dynamic characteristics of the structure while Q are the amplitude that tells me how much of each mode shape I need. And notice how this transformation allows me to go from here to here. Now, if I, you can see here that I need the identity matrix here and zero here because I have UB and uh, I want to get UB here again. So multiply this column with this row, sorry, this row with this column and you get UB. So that's why I need that. Um, and the second row I have UL which is phi r times this number, and then plus phi l times this number. So hopefully that's clear to you. What we're trying to do 
is, is convert this UL to the model space for a minute and then work in this space as much as I can because I know the mode shapes of the system and my idea here is to reduce everything that the boundary knows, this UB here. So if you pre-multiply, so if I substitute this whole expression uh, here, so for U, a, U double dot A, uh, I plug it in, I plug this in here, I call this phi, phi CV. I get this, I get phi CB times that, phi CB times that, and then phi CB times that. Well, actually I don't have a phi CB there because I don't have U, U or deflection there. Then what I'll do then, I'll pre-multiply by phi CB like I've done before with the, with the idea of hope, hopefully getting some, you know, some diagonalization. Uh, and so that's what I've done here. And now I have written the equations of motion in the mod space, right? So that was the idea there. And perhaps I lost you at this point, that's okay. Big picture perspective, Craig Bantam models are really used to uh, basically reduce the model to boundary nodes uh, for multiple purposes. You perhaps don't want to provide your model to another contractor who is going to use your model for analysis. One reason, second reason is to reduce the models for enabling a, a solving equations of motions in a timely fashion. Imagine if you have millions of degrees of freedom trying to solve them over time. Uh, that's going to take forever to solve, and it's going to also reduce your ability to do sensitivity studies. So uh, in multiplying, doing this multiplication, what you will find is the following dynamic equations uh, is going to result in this. Uh, and I, I don't want to go into extensive details, uh, but what, what we, have, we have done is added the damping matrix separately after doing this operation here. Um, similar to what we've done in the past. Uh, so here's your acceleration terms, your velocity terms, which are multi energetically conjugate to uh, the damping terms, and then you have the stiffness uh, conjugate to the deflections. Um, we're going to assume that you don't apply any forces uh, at the internal nodes, uh, so many, meaning that FL is zero, uh, it makes sense. I'm going to apply loads primarily to the boundary degrees of freedom. So that goes to zero and that further simplifies the modeling. So in summary, this is a summary really. Like once you solve for U, B, and Q, you can then go back and recover uh, what is going on physically with the internal degrees of freedom that you had reduced. So in summary, the Craig Bampton theory allows to define mass matrices and stiffness matrices for the, for the whole system, uh, but it allows you to reduce it to the boundary nodes. You can then use dynamic analysis to solve the problem, and it allows you to then calculate the physical responses, uh, because once you solve for uh, the modal space, Q, Q is in the modal space, these are basically the amplitudes that multiply the mode shapes, um, and then these are the boundary nodes. Once you solve for that, you can go back to the physical space and determine the full deflections uh, for the system in the physical space. So very, very cool stuff. The very great invention that allowed uh, for pretty significant uh, 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 simplifications. Now I'm going to move to Pogo analysis. Uh, I want to talk about Pogo as an effect, uh, and I invite you again to read the NASA experience with Pogo in human spaceflight vehicles written by Dr. Curtis Larson, who is a technical failure or, or now retired from NASA for the loads and dynamics, and used to work for the NESC as a lead. So the United, uh, the United, United States Air Force began test flights with the Titan II uh, program in 1962. 19 seconds into the flight, the first stage flight, uh, you had a significant amount of vibration uh, from 10 to 13 hertz for roughly 30 seconds, reaching an amplitude of close to plus minus two and a half Gs, about 11 hertz. Uh, so in the longitudinal direction. So as a, you can imagine, as a launch vehicle is going 
is ascending, that you have this longitudinal vibration that's causing the vehicle to vibrate up and down. Uh, so that's why it's called pogo, because it's like a pogo stick. Uh, if you've seen a pogo stick, pause the video right now and watch a YouTube video that describes that. Uh, and you will see what I mean. What can cause pogo? What can, can, what can, what, what can cause pogo in general? Uh, it's a surge in engine pressure. So you can have a surge in engine pressure that increases the back pressure against the fuel coming into the engine. It will reduce the engine pressure as a consequence and then cause more fuel to come in and increase the engine pressure again. So that feedback uh, is going to continue causing this oscillation. Another cause of uh, a pogo is flexing of the fuel pipes and can also induce fluctuations in fuel pressure. If the cycle happens, if these particular fluctuations uh, happen to match the resonance frequency of the rocket, then you're going to have dangerous oscillations that can then uh, uh, basically uh, induce a positive feedback and in extreme cases it can cause a vehicle to tear apart. Another cause of pogo is engine, the engine is moving longitudinal with fluctuation speed. If the speed of the vehicle suddenly increases, the fuel and, and the fluctuating speed can be due to many reasons, but the fuel inside the fuel tank will fall, then fall behind and be forced and pushed onto the turbo pump. That will increase, think about it, it will increase an increased pressure in the turbo pump and then it will cause unintended excessive fuel to be delivered. So you'll be expending more fuel than what you thought. This in turn creates even more thrust and causes the vehicle to accelerate, which further increases the turbo pump pressure and unintended increase in fuel delivery. So this will cause a vicious cycle that can also cause pogo behavior. So again, very important to see why this could be caused, I invite you to pause the video. If you go to YouTube, you will find some Pogo videos uh, that could be helpful in understanding these ideas. Apollo 13 vehicle, vehicle had a severe Pogo vibration with a center engine during the stage, second stage burn. The engine experienced a 34 G vibration at 16 Hertz, flexing thrust frame by, it actually flexed a thrust frame by 2.6 inches peak to peak plus minus. And so how you could calculate that? Uh, there's a calculation they can perform uh, that, that's fairly simple uh, that allows you to determine that. Uh, but here is a calculation. Uh, a is a, uh, accelerations. Uh, here's a number of Gs and you know, converting that into inch per second squared. And then you have the 16 Hertz here. Uh, and so this calculation will give you 2.6 inches. The solution that Apollo, that, that was performed on the Apollo um, was that a helium gas accumulator was added to the liquid oxygen line. Uh, the accumulator was also referred to as suppressor. Uh, the accumulator reservoir uh, worked to dampen the fluid pressure oscillations, which we talked about causing the pogo. So it's actually, uh, reducing that oscillation, keeping keeping them out of phase with the vibrations of the thrust structure and the engine, so you don't have uh, any any uh, resonant condition. The accumulator also lowered the first natural frequency of the propellant line, line and also uh, it, it helped by decoupling it with the vehicle structural frequencies. Let's cover random vibrations. Uh, some spacecraft components may require calculating the fatigue life of parts on the periodic vibration input, which could be straightforward if you know um, the nature of the input. In this case, the nature of the input tends to be predictable, is periodic, and is uh, sinusoidal in this case. However, vibrations may be random in nature in a wide variety of applications and arbitrary loads may be encountered. Instantaneous vibration inputs are not highly predictable at any point in time. And the vibration inputs at this point may not be related to any other point. And so there is a lack of a periodic behavior with these random vibration inputs. 
some learning environments have to be treated as a random phenomena when the forces involved are controlled by non-deterministic parameters. Examples of those tend to be high-frequency engine thrust oscillations, aerodynamic buffeting, aerodynamic turbulence, sound pressure acting on the surface of the payload, or pressure fluctuations on the aircraft. An earthquake ground motion is an example of random vibration where you cannot predict uh, the motion at any point in time. Acoustic excitation due to rocket and jet engine noise is another example. In all these examples, the motion varies randomly with time. The amplitude cannot be expressed in a deterministic mathematical function. The, the most obvious characteristics of random vibration is that it is not periodic. A knowledge of the past his history of random motion is adequate to determine the probability of occurrence of various accelerations and deflections, but it's not sufficient to predict the precise magnitude in any specific instance. Space structures and their appendages are typically subject to base excitations driven by random vibra vibrations. Random vibrations can occur, and you could have frequencies of a range and could be present at some magnitudes all the time. Here's an example of a mass subject to a base excitation. And here's a random acceleration input. And the point being here is that this input is not periodic in nature, is random in nature. So continuous structures have many resonances over a frequency range, we know that. So random vibration will excite and can cause a resonance all the time. And so it could cause large responses. Hence, random vibrations will cause failures uh, that harmonic excitations may not. One example of a random process is a Gaussian process, in which you have a collection of random variables that follow a normal distribution. Here, I have an example of stresses that are random as a function of time. And if I were to look at the distribution and occurrence on a basis of a Gaussian process is going to have this curve, this type of curve here. Another way to look at it is that you have magnitudes uh, that are varying randomly over time, but I can calculate the number of occurrences for the peak amplitudes, uh, and I can determine um, the number of occurrences for the uh, lower amplitudes of vibrations. Random vibration analysis describes the forcing functions and the corresponding structural responses statistically. We have to do it statistically, and we cannot do it deterministically because the inputs are not, they're not periodic or repetitive. The, it is assumed when you do a random vibration analysis that the phasing of vibration at different frequencies are uncor uncorrelated. The amplitude of motion at each frequency is typically described by power spectral density function. And I'll discuss that in a second. So the time domain information with a random process can be expressed in a power spectral density function, which will characterize the frequency content of the process. In this example, the time domain information has been put into, has been put into power spectral density function. And here, you have the simplest form of a PSD, in other words. Uh, here, PSD represents, uh, will have units of G squared divided by Hertz. Those will, those will be the units of PSD. And pl typically, the PSD is plotted as a function of frequency, and the area under the curve usually represents the RMS of the input that we're discussing. The PSD can also be expressed in terms of deflections and velocity, and the vibration inputs are typically given as PSDs. The PSDs indicate RMS vibration levels at various frequencies. The PSD can be obtained from field data or given as requirements from the launch vehicle provider. Here we have a simple PSD, but here we have here we have a more complex PSD. And the idea is that the Random vibration input can be a great representation of that time domain information. Here's an example of uh, 
random vibration signals. And you could have random vibration signals uh, that are a function of time for multiple launch launches, uh, for example. Or if you have an aircraft and you're flying it 200 times, to determine what kinds of vibrations you can impart into the electronics, you can then come up with a PSD input for every time that you fly it. So you will take this time domain, process the signal, come up with this out of spectral density information or PSD information as a function of frequency. And for every flight, you may have different uh, PSDs that you came up with. Then what you can come up with is a smooth envelope that covers all the um, PhDs that you have collected uh, from the different flights. And typically you will use this at the, uh, you will use this curve as a design curve. Random vibration analysis is usually performed in the range of 10, 20 hertz to 2000 hertz. And the severity of the damage really depends on the power spectral density. The PSD really measures the vibration signal's power intensity in the frequency dom do domain. The way to evaluate it to determine the average value of the amplitudes is to look at the information within a, within a frequency range. So the PSD will tell us how the power of random signal is distributed over a frequency range, in essence. We're really interested in the statistical structural response due to the random vibration environment. The square root of the area under the PSD curve gives the acceleration root mean square GRMS, which is a qualitative measure of quantity of intensity of vibration. Here is an example of that. The square root of the area under this curve gives me GRMS, the root mean square. And the higher the GRMS, the more potential for damage. So the RMS is useful because it is directly related to the energy content of the vibration. And so it tells us a lot about the destructive nature of the vibration. The RMS also will take into account the time history of the waveform. The severity of the random vibe is also driven by the maximum PSD value or PSD value of the frequency of the resonances of the structure. So those, those three parameters really go into redetermining really how destructive uh, the, the, the random vibe is into that structure. So let's look at a periodic signal, for example. The RMS value, if I'm looking at the RMS value of a periodic signal, X of T, so say I have a variable uh, of this nature, and I'm looking at the period of T equals one over F, F in this case is frequency, one over frequency is the per period that I'm looking at. So if I wanna calculate the RMS over this period, uh, I'll set a T naught as the R an arbitrary value, integrate this signal, square XT, integrate this, divided by one over T, and then take the square root of that. That'll give me the, the RMS value of this periodic signal. The RMS of a random signal, on the other hand, is calculated using this formula instead. And so it's quite different from the one I have here, but they have a very similar, uh, very similar flavor to it. Here's an example of a harmonic deflection. Say I have a harmonic deflection of this nature, and in this example, the period of time is this much. So then I can substitute in this top formula integrate that and then to the one half here, uh, D here uh, is squared here in, in the parenthetical. Uh, so I can bring it out as constant and then I can do the integral and what you'll find is that the RMS is one half D squared of two. So the more, the higher the amplitude, as you can see, the higher the RMS. Uh, so you can see how this could be detrimental to the behavior of the structure. Um, very similarly, the random vibration signal, uh, when you integrate these equations, are going to tell you a lot about this um, uh, RMS value. It's going to tell you a lot about the vibration signal and the power that carries. So how to analyze a structure subject to random vibration inputs? One of the things we're interested in understanding is the fatigue life of the part.
when the part is subjected to this random vibe input. The finite element analysis procedure is typically uh, comes, uh, formed of the following steps. You have to define the geometry of the model. You want to then develop the finite element model with properties and boundary conditions fully defined. You will then perform a model analysis and then determine the relevant modes for random vibration analysis. And so here, what you're trying to do is extract the modes uh, and the frequencies and mode shapes. And as we discussed before, those represent the model characteristics of the structure. We then will develop a PSD from the time domain using uh, that information, or we'll use a PSD spec. We can then, we can then define a PSD deflections velocity, acceleration, and stress responses at those specific nodes, and then we'll calculate and estimate the RMS response, such as the deflections, velocities, accelerations, and stress. I'll be discussing this in a lot more detail as we go through this uh, lecture. So here's an example uh, of a validation case using finite elements. The random vibration analysis procedure of a steel this cantilevered and attached a stiff vibrating structure is gonna be studied now. And it's gonna be subjected to this transverse acceleration with this power spectral density provided here. Again, G squared per hertz is the units, and then in the X axis we have the frequency. And so this PSD input is provided, and the results are then compared with this paper. The steel information is provided here along with the density, we're gonna use a 10% structural damping, it's pretty high, but we're just doing that to, to try to compare to the test, to, to this paper here. And then we're gonna use beam elements in abacus. So that, that's the idea here is to be able to compare that to abacus. Basically use abacus and then compare it against this paper. I apologize. We're gonna then look at uh, the results from abacus. And what you find is that the response uh, from Abacus matches the response from the literature. And this is a plot that you get. We're gonna be plotting that in a minute. Uh, we're gonna have an invited guest uh, walk us through the Abacus tutorial on how to do this. But uh, it, it matches really well. Another classical example um, is the random response analysis. Um, so let's go to the second example. The random vibration analysis is now performed for an aluminum beam with an attached end mass. And uh, we're gonna be subjecting that base to a white noise with this uh, intensity. Again, this is a PSD input as a function of frequency. And recall that you can have time domain information that can then be used to come up with this PSD input. Sometimes the PSD input is given as a spec. Um, and in this analysis, uh, solid elements were used, 10 modes were used. First, a frequency extraction, extraction procedure was used, and then those modes were used in the second analysis, which is a random response analysis. A 5% direct modal damping was used in the analysis. So we can determine the mode shifts and as associated frequencies. You can see here, here the, the, the mode shifts and the frequencies. This happens to be the first bending mode, and then you can have more complex modes as you go. The stress PSD peak response was plotted. Here you can see that, and, and here the stress output here is going to be units of stress squared divided by hertz. And here is the, um, what you see here is a plot of the peak response, uh, which coincides in essence with the first frequency of 55 hertz, 56 hertz. And this is the response that you get. So now what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna pass it on to Li Fu uh, Wang, who I've invited, so he can guide us through the Abacus tutorial. Thank you, Professor. Now we are going to apply these concepts and see how to use Abacus to model random vibration responses. So we're going to apply the abacus to do two problems. The first one is a typical cantilever beam. 
who has a length of one meters and the cross section area is 100 millimeters by 100 millimeters. The material property is steel, which has Young's modulus of two, <coughs> 210 gigapascal, 0.3 Poisson's ratio, and 8,000 kilograms per meter cube. The analysis range we are going to use is from 20 hertz to two, uh, 2,000 hertz, and 10% structure damping was going to be used. And we're going to use 10 moles uh, to do the analysis. And the entire beam is split into 10 elements, and the element type is B23, which is cubic, um, <clears throat> two node cubic beam element. According to Johnson, in his book, Linear Dynamic Analysis, Random Response, and in 1978, he has a theoretical result for the input uh, power spectrum density like this. <clears throat> and the output, according to the literature, should look like this. And we're going to see compare the abacus result and the literature result to validate that our analysis is, is correct. So here's the abacus part. Create a 2D object, being 2D wine and one for that. And use zero, zero and one, zero to create a wire. And in your property, create a steel with density of 8,000 kilograms per meter cube and uh, Young's modulus 210 E9 Pascal and 0.3 Poisson's ratio. Create a section, beam section. and create a cross-section area. Our cross-section area is a rectangle with 0.1 and 0.1, a square cross-section. So section Poisson ratio 0.3. Assign the section. Don't need to assign, uh, don't need to create sets and then create the direction. Since the two dimensions are the same, so it doesn't really matter where is the dimensions. So we just use the default value. And now the step. First, we need to do model analysis to obtain the resonant frequencies and the mole shape, corresponding mole shape in the linear perturbation frequency. And we only need 10 moles from that. So just enter 10. And now create the random vibration response. Random response under linear perturbation. Our lower frequency analysis frequency is 20. Upper is 2,000. And we can make it a little bit finer. Let's put a uh, 30 here. And the VS, we make it one. So it's one means it's linearly distributed in the logarithm scale. So now we assign the structure damping from mode one to mode 10. All of them has a damping constant of 0.1. And uh, and now we can go to the field response. Since we are going later, we are going to obtain the stress. We can actually select the stresses here so that this will be passed to the random vibration response. But just in case, we can select all the stresses so that you won't miss anything. 
and Abacus will automatically select the one that is useful. And here, uh, we the output part, we have the acceleration, uh, the strain, the stress, uh, velocity, and the displacement. That's pretty enough here. But later, probably, we can add the one meter stress. And now, in the load, uh, sorry, we forgot to create a section. So create the independent section instant from that. And then at the load, first we create the uh, cantilever beam. So for cantilever beam in the initial, we select the fixed end. This is a fixed end and apply the fixed boundary condition. Uh, now we create the vibration input. So select uh, your random vibration response step and apply the acceleration based motion. Since we're going to apply the U2 for vibration, we are specifying the correlation and since we are doing only one degrees of freedom, it doesn't matter if you select what, we just select uncorrelated. And here, if you right click, you can create the SPD definition, uh, sorry, PSD definition. And now select the gravity and 9.81 as the gravity constant. For real part, we can follow this graph Select so this point, this point, this point, and this point to represent the input. So as the frequency for that is 20, 52, 900, 2000. So we add four row for that. And then 20, 52, 900, 2000. The corresponding value, since we are not introducing any phase change, we just enter real value which is 0 0.02, 0 0.53, uh, sorry, 0 0.053, and 0 0.053, and 0 0.0022. 0 0.02, uh, and 0 0.0022. All the imagined parts is zero. Now the real, since we already uh, in, uh, input the cor corresponding value, we don't need to make any amplification here, just make it one and no phase change zero for a major part. Once it's done, let's go to the mesh. So your element type here, right now is B21, which is two non linear, uh, linear for in a plane. So we change it to cubic. So now it's a cubic element. So we do point 0.1 since we want 10 elements inside the spin. And then we do the mesh. Now we can create a job called beam 1. Submit. Oh, I think when I assigned the, I forgot to assign the uh, direction. Since the two dimensions are the same, so we just leave it default. And do remember to click OK for that to make sure it's assigned. Now submit. Since we're not opting any history response, we can just click OK and wait until they finish. Let's see the result first. So the theoretical result shows that it has a peak at around here, which is around nine or eight, 90 or 80, between 80 and 90, closer to 90. And the maximum is a little slightly above the 10, 1e e minus 10, uh, 1e e minus 8. And it has a second peak at a frequency of around 
two, three, four, five, around 500 something. And the value for that is around 1e minus 11. This two should be the resonant frequency for the structure. And once it's done, we can see the result. And here first, let's see the resonant frequency. So you can see the first mole has a frequency of 82. So which is very close to what we have for theoretical result, this one. And the second mode is around 518. So very close to this one. So these two modes are included in this response. Now we can see the response by getting a XY data create from the field output. And here we can select the displacement U2, which is what we want. And here we select the unique nodal, nodal. And to pick the node that we're interested, we choose the free end which has the largest displacement. Click this edit selection and then select this from the viewpoint and click down. One node is selected. And then here, active step. We don't need a model analysis anymore. We just need a render response. So plot it. Now you can see the result. The result is a little bit coarse since our number of steps in between the frequency is not too much. But you can clearly see the value here. To probe the value, we do tours, query, and then probe values. And we can probe this one. You can see that it's at 82, which is your resonant frequency, and the value is a little bit more than 1e minus 8, which is the same as this one. And the second value, the frequency is 518, which is close to this one, and the value is 3.5e minus 13, which is, uh, which is a wrong, uh, sorry, 3.5 minus 12, so which is around this point. And it's very close to this one. Smaller, a little bit smaller than uh, 1e minus 11. So if you want it to be more accurate, you can see the higher response is not that much accurate. So if you want it to be accurate, you can always have finer mesh to it. and so that your mode shade of the resonant frequency will be more accurate. Now, since we validate our data, oh, another thing for showing the result is in your option, X, Y option axis, <clears throat> uh, originally the default is linear. Now we change it to log logarithm plot and we can also change the scale compared to this one, which is from minus 17 to minus seven, minus seven to minus, minus 17 to minus seven. And for X, definitely you can follow this one is from 10 to a southern, so from 10. But for Abacus, since our analysis only apply from zero to, sorry, from 20 to two, a southern. So if you put 10 here, you can see there's a zero, zero at 10 and directly connecting to the start point of our analysis. So it's better to show just the analysis step from 20. Now, since the model is validated, we're going to move on to the second problem, which is a typical cantilever being attached with a mass at the end, at the free end who has a, with a value of 0.2 kilograms. The length for the beam is 0.15 meters and the cross-section area is 0.015 in width and seven millimeters in height. So the beam is made of aluminum who has a Young's modulus of 68.9 gigapascal. The Poisson's ratio is 0.3 and the 
density is 2700 kilograms per meter cube. The analysis range we are going to apply here is 20 to, from 20 to 200 hertz with a 5% direct model damping, 10 moles required. And to show the actual stress distribution, we actually build a 3D model here. So the element we are going to use is uh, three uh, is the eight node brick element <clears throat> with the incompatible incompa incompatible mode. We are going to input an uh, acceleration uh, power spectrum density, which is shown here from twenty two hundred, and all the value is point four seven five. And now let's see how do we do that in Abacus. Create a 3D beam first. And the proximal size just put 0.2 or 0.3. Use the uh, square toolbox put zero, 0, here and length is 0.15, height is 0 0.007. And the extrusion is the width direction is 0 0.015. This is your beam. Now assign the material property, aluminum, density is 2770 kilograms per meter cube. Young's modulus 68.99, Poisson's ratio 0.3. And assign the section solid homogeneous because this is a 3D, uh, 3D uh, geometry. Sorry, now assign the section to our geometry. Now we create assembling the instant, independent instance. So later we're going to apply the mass at the, exactly the center of the instant. So to do that, we need to split the instant into four parts. And to do that, we can create the datum planes first. First, we create an XY plane and split that in XY direction. Uh, so we do x y x sorry x y plane, and then offset is half of the width, which is 0 0.0075, which is in the middle of the plate. So we create another x z plane, and emit, and the value should be half of the height, so 0 0.0035. Now we use this to a long click and select this one. Partition self using datum plane. Select this datum plane and enter. You see that it's split. And select all the cell and then enter. Select this datum plane, enter. And you see that it's split into four parts. Now create a step. Similar to previously, first we do model analysis, which is uh, linear perturbation frequency. Only 10 value is needed. And uh, now create a, uh, the random response. So random vibration response. So now we start from 20 and at 200, let's just make it 10 to make the result faster. Cause now we're doing 3D almond. If you make it large, it will take a long time. Still logarithm. And this time we're going to assign the direct model damping 5%. So direct model damping from first mode to the 10th mode with 5% critical damping. And 
same as previously in your field output if you want to apply the stress you need to click uh, check stress here and here what we output is uh, other than this one we also include this one root mean square of stresses and I'll show you why we include that So, in your interaction, we assign the inertia here uh, in the special inertia manager. So we can create a new one called point mass. Since this mass, we are going to uh, use a Point 0.2 kilograms point mass representing this mass. So point mass and then select the point we just created here. And the value should be point 0.2 kilograms. Now we go to the load, same as previously. First, we need to fix the end, fix this end to make it a cantilever beam. So select all four faces and last one. Now it's fixed. And create an input for your random response. Acceleration response same as previously, we want U2, so U2 vibration, and then uncorrelated since we only have one degree of freedom, and right click this one and create PSD definition, PSD definition, and this time we only need two points for that. One is 20, one is 200, and the value is 0.475. So, 0 0.475, 0 0.475, 20, 200. And the imagined part is just zero. Select that to be gravity based and enter the gravity 9.81 here. Now real is one, imagine it's zero. We are not changing the face. And now our input is, is, is fine. Do the mesh. Global size, we assign a two millimeter global size and then mesh the insum. And in your element type, the default is reduce integration. So it's C3D8R. We change it to incom incompatible modes, which is C3D8I. This can greatly change, inc increase your response in bending. And now in your job, create a job called it being two. And we're not opening any history response, so just leave it there. This is a 3D model, so it should be way slower than the previous one. And let's see what we expect to see. According to the previous result, we are expecting to see a peak at the resonant frequency similar to this one. And, and our response, we want to see the root mean square of the response. So the root mean square Basically, it's your power density, uh, power spectrum density. Do the integration of the spectrum, and then take square root to it. And it has a time domain meaning for that. But you can see also see the unit here. The original input unit is g square divided by hertz. So if you do integration, it will become g square and then take square root, it will become g, which, which is your acceleration. So if you can get the power spectrum density for your stress, do integration and take square root, you can get the unit of Pascal. 
and I'll show you two ways to get the rooming square of your uh, stresses here. And what we're interested the most is at the fixed end, because that will have the largest, uh, <clears throat> largest stress. And definitely we are more interested at the top or bottom surface, because only at the top, as you know, in bending theory, in the neutral plane, the stress sigma one is zero. So we are interested in maximum stress, which is top or bottom. And uh, if you want to see the maximum deflection, definitely it happens at the end. But if you want to see the stress, we will choose the fixed end, which has the largest um, stress because it has the largest moment. Now since it's complete, let's see the result. You can see that the stress here is zero while the stress here on the top surface has the maximum value. And if you see, let's see the resonant mode first. For the first resonant frequency is about 56. So we are expecting to see some resonant frequency, uh, so some peak at 56 Hertz. And the second mode is 120. But if you see the mode shape, you can see that it's a bending mode through the Z direction. But since our input is Y direction, we won't expect to see any peak at 120 Hertz. If you, you see the third mode, the frequency is already a southern hertz but since our analysis is only end at uh, 200 hertz so we won't see anything for your third mode now let's see the spectrum same as previously xy data manager and create from field output and first let's see the stress first Let's just see S11. Choose unique node, pick from viewpoint, select any point on this end and on the top surface. Let's just select the very left corner. And active slab, we don't need a model one, we only need the RVR. So plot it. It's clear that Let's probe the value. It's clear that around the resonant frequency, we get the maximum uh, of the stress. The reason we cannot, uh, the reason we cannot get exactly at the resonant frequency is we may not have the sampling point there. <clears throat> so the value for that is around 3.33 e. 14 and the unit for that should be Pascal square over Hertz. So two way to do, uh, there are two way to get the rooming square for that. As I mentioned before, if you do integration of this plot and then take square root, you can get the rooming square. To do that, we can do create and operate on XY data and enter the formula here as square root of integrate of this value. This curve stands for the curve you just have. Double click that and two ending bracket. Plot the expression, you can see the value here. This is your rooming square. It's converging to a fixed number. If you probe the value, At the end, it should be around 56 megapascal. That will be your rooming square uh, of the stress, of your bending stress, sigma one. The other way to do it is directly create from the field output. Remember, we just output the variable rooming square of the stress component we select the sigma one 
the same point here, if you plot it, you can see that you can probe the value for that one. It's around 56, which is the same as what we obtained previously. And And if you see the, how the result is, you can see that with different frequency, you can see different response. Some of them may have large deflection, some of them may not. That's all in frequency domain, not in time domain. So now I will hand it back to Professor Goyao and he will show you how are you going to use those results for further prediction of the fatigue. So thank you, Lifu. Now that we have calculated the, um, the root mean square, uh, we're gonna use this information to calculate the fatigue life of, the, of this particular cantilever beam. And we're gonna use the standard fatigue analysis procedures we have discussed before. And our approach is to use the most common approaches, which is the three bend technique using the minus cumulative damage ratio. I'll be discussing how this is done. So the equivalent RMS per the tutorial uh, was found to be 58 PSI. Uh, and so we're gonna use that information. Um, and I've corrected here, this is megapascals. Um, and we're gonna then take a Gaussian distribution. So 50, the RMS here really corresponds to the one sigma event. And uh, when I look at this random response signal, a one sigma event occurs about 68% of the time. Uh, you can see here that this amplitude will occur about 68% of the time. Two sigma values typically will occur about 27% of the time, while three sigma values will occur about 4.33% of the time. You can also look at higher sigmas, but that will reduce really quickly uh, and may not even contribute to fatigue as much. So you can refine this even further. So this is basically using statistical theory. Uh, and the idea here is that if I know that 58 megapascals at one sigma occurs at 68% of the time, I can then determine how many peaks at this amplitude I am getting and count them. Uh, but since I know that this is a random uh, output, I should be able to use statistics to figure that out. So in this case, we know that we have an RMS value of 58 at one sigma, and it occurs about 68% of the time. We have two sigma, which occurs about uh, uh, twice of this stress at 27% of the time. And then three sigma, sigma which is 174 megapascals at 4% of the time. And you can even go higher if you wanted to, but then the occurrence is, is so low, you will not even, uh, it may not even play a role. And so how do we calculate the maximum life corresponding to each stress level? So the idea is to take each of these stress levels, which are here on the right-hand side, and figure out what is the maximum number of cycles to failure. So at, for example, 58, as an example, and this is just an example, at 58, uh, I, I will find a number, the maximum number of cycles to failure. At 116, then I'll find the maximum number of cycles to failure. And then at three sigma stress, I'll get calculate the 174, uh, sorry, the number of cycles to failure corresponding to three sigma standard deviation. And so here, the idea then is to use the number of cycles to failure to calculate uh, the damage index using the minors rule. The next step is to calculate the number of cycles for that stress level. So say I'm going to determine what is the amount of damage induced by four hours of vibration. So four hours of vibration is quite significant. Uh, what I can do then is to determine the dominant frequency in our analysis. We know that the dominant frequency in our analysis uh, due to this peak response is 56. Uh, is, is a frequency of 56. Um, so uh, in this case, that dominant frequency can be used here, uh, multiplied by the operational time, in this case is four hours converted into seconds, uh, 
And then I want to calculate the percentage of occurrence. And so if I multiply all this, I know the percentage of occurrence is 68.3 in this case. So that's the number of cycles for one sigma. And then for two sigma, again, I go here with a 27% of occurrence and calculate the number of cycles for that. And then for three sigma, using the 4%, the number of cycles for that. So that will give me the number of cycles that I have to use in the damage, damage index calculations. I want to also point out that you, you want to redetermine that you have the correct dominant frequency. Another way to determine that you have the dominant frequency is when you calculate the RMS. You will notice that when you reach 57 um, hertz, that most of the RMS has been achieved. Uh, so please go back to the tutorial uh, that was shown to demonstrate that. And so then I'll take, uh, in, in, this, in this case, I only have three terms in the damage index. N1, N2, and N3 were calculated here. N1, N2, and N3. And then this small N1, N2, and N3 have been calculated here. So then I will have it here in the numerator and denominator and then perform the damage index calculation. So in this example, you will find that the one RMS value does almost no damage, even though its effects last for 68% of the time. While the majority of the damage is caused by a three RMS level, when it only acts about 4% of the time. And I encourage you to look at the damage inquired uh, or induced by those uh, RMS levels. While fatigue life evaluation on the random process is highly complicated, uh, we've simplified the process by using Miner's rules. Uh, we recommend that for design, the value of the damage index be limited to 0.25 um, or 0.5 even, depending upon the program that you're working on. And depending upon how much testing that you, you have done, could help you then scale back or scale up, depending upon how comfortable you feel. High cycle fatigue typically um, has high scatter, as we have discussed before. Uh, so please check out that YouTube video on high cycle fatigue, and you will see that high cycle fatigue does have high scatter. And so it may be best to your interest that if you have high cycle fatigue, and the structure is sensitive to fatigue, um, that this damage index be kept in the 0.1 value. Uh, again, this is a program decision, and so you wanna basically determine the requirements for that program, but also challenge the, the requirements if you feel those are not the right requirements for that particular structure you're trying to analyze, given the material data information you may have available. I want to explain that in really looking at these time histories of the excitation, and in this case we have, let's say I have this uh, excitation here, looking at that alone, it is not obvious how to evaluate the constantly changing acceleration amplitude. And so we found a way of doing that by converting that time domain into a PSD input. And then we, we have now found a way of evaluating the average value of all amplitudes within a given frequency range. Although the acceleration amplitude at a given frequency constantly changes, changes, its average value tends to be remain relatively constant. And we saw that when we looked at the RMS value. Once it reaches a value, it tends to remain constant. This powerful characteristics of a random process provides a great tool to easily evaluate fatigue damage due to these vibration inputs that could be quite complex. Let's look at example number three, which comes from the literature. You have to simulate the random vibrations of the strut structure here, uh, which is subject to a uh, vibration input provided by this qual spec. And we want to really understand uh, what is going on in terms of the structural behavior. The structure is subject to a vibe test in accordance to the NASA STD 7001. Uh, and then figure 6.1 and 6.2, uh, you, if you look at the Falcon 9 launch vehicle payload user's guide, which is a public document, will provide additional information as an example. But here is the NASA qual spec that we're gonna be using to analyze this payload with this strut mechanism. And this was not done by me, it's, uh, is recorded in the literature and I invite you to search the literature for this particular paper. 
The random vibration analysis was performed using the PZ input for the NASA spec for a period of two minutes, and the fatigue analysis was performed using the miner's, miner's rule again, using aluminum 6061 SN curve. So again, using a very similar process, what we've done is use a three-band approach and then calculate the number of cycles uh, per based on their currents, and the dominant frequency in this case was 124 hertz. Just with this information and the fact that it's two minutes, you should be able to replicate this number of cycles. And then using the RMS data and using the fatigue data, we can calculate the maximum number of cycles for each of the stress levels. The RMS corresponds to one sigma, twice RMS corresponds to two sigma, three, R, three times RMS corresponds to three sigma. So a damage index calculation in this case came out to be 0.13, which is fairly benign. And so very limited damage will have been accumulated during this test. Example number four is considering this auxiliary heater bracket, which uh, is then um, mounted on a chassis with a base PSD input provided here. And this one is documented in this paper. And in this particular analysis, it was found that the response uh, was really obtained to be 130 Hertz. Um, uh, so the response was 130 Hertz. Uh, the first mode of the bracket uh, was 14 Hertz or so. And you can see that showing up here. And since the response was found up to 130 hertz, you can see here there's nothing else picking up. Uh, in other words, um, most of the RMS will have been picked up at this point in time, at this particular frequency. So the equivalent RMS was used in the fatigue life calculation, and they use a structural damping ratio of 2%. And so here, James, I'm just again illust illustrating a big picture view. Uh, when you calculate the RMS, most of it will have been accumulated by this point, just looking at this PSD peak response as a, as a function of frequency. And so uh, you will see here that the mode of vibrations are shown here for this particular structure. And in this case, they actually redesigned the structure to try to minimize um, this peak response by adding brackets and things like that. I invite you to look at that paper in more detail. So the equivalent RMS stress was used in the calculation. You can see here that 13 hertz, most of the RMS is achieved. And then using the RMS value, the fatigue calculation can be performed using a very similar process to what we discussed. Remember again how the PSD stress output in this case has units of MPA squared divided by hertz. And the area under this curve, the square root of the area under this, on, on the, on this, under this curve gives us the RMS stress. And you can see why this is constant. And the reason the RMS is constant is because if I look at the area under this curve, um, most of the area is under this peak response. And after that, there's not much area. So all the RMS has been accumulated at this point in time. So using that information should be fairly simple to calculate the fatigue damage due to this random vibration input. Uh, example number five shows the aircraft vibration analysis. Again, you will have a, some amount of, uh, a, you're gonna have a time domain information. And sometimes the PSD can vary as a function of time as well. So it's important to consider uh, this kind of information in the analysis. Random vibration testing uh, is, is performed typically for electronic boxes and tanks, uh, small tanks typically, uh, and it is really used to qualify them. Uh, the random, and you can also perform acceptance testing based on that. Random vibration loads for qualification of the spacecraft generally will last 100, 120 seconds and are applied also to the qualification model. The duration of the uh, acceptance testing, which, which is a workmanship screen, is about 60 seconds typically. The input during a random test usually will mix frequencies between 20 and 200, 2,000 hertz. Here's an example of a fuel tank which, which was subject to these 20 to 2,000 hertz with a spec that was provided, uh, and for the, in this case, is the Artemis um, fuel tank for the Artemis. Uh, 
And then this is the duration, two minutes. I also want to discuss really quickly the quasi-static approximation can also be performed using the Miles equation uh, when you're uh, analyzing random vibration uh, problems. Uh, first, you will have the finite element model of the structure. Uh, then you will calculate the model analysis, extract the mode shapes and frequencies. You want to then select the dominant mode shapes and then determine uh, a, 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 the, what is a static G loading that I can apply. Estimate that load and apply that to a static load, apply to the model statically, and then calculate the stress response of that structure. I want to quickly illustrate that with a cantilever beam. So the Miles equation really assumes a single degree of freedom behavior of a structure. The limitation is that the shape in this case is excited by a single mode, um, and it's supposed to be an approximation of the profile of the structure on their static inertial load. In this case, I had the first mode shapes, and you can see here that the first mode shapes looks a lot like if, we were, if I were to apply a static load to this structure, uh, so it's, it looks similar uh, to the first mode shape. So that's an approximation because the static deformation may not look like the first mode shape. So you can calculate the equivalent G, uh, RMS value or, 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 or that can be applied to this structure. And you will be using this equation here, uh, which is the equivalent Gs that need to, need to be applied to this structure in order to match or get the random vibration RMS um, that you have gotten through a comprehensive analysis. So here's a formula square root of pi over two, the natural frequency um, of the structure of interest. Here is the amplification factor, which is really the quality factor or is equal to two, one over two uh, C. And then here is uh, the, the level of the, is the input at that particular frequency of interest. And so once you calculate this G value, you can then size the design for three sigma loads, so three times G, or you can also do a fatigue analysis in the way that we discussed it. Now this is a very first order approximation, and it could be misused if um, the structures are behaving such that it does not behave like a single degree of freedom. And it's not dominated by a single frequency. Jitter is another type of analysis that needs to be performed, and it's really a random vibration analysis. Uh, jitter, which are micro vibrations, can affect the spacecraft performance and can be caused by dynamic and static imbalances in the reaction wheels. Here we have a structure that can have instruments that are quite sensitive, sensitive to vibrations, and it's important that these vibrations be minimized if it can be minimized. In some cases, they cannot be minimized. So we have to find out how these dynamic uh, vibrations can impact the performance of the instrumentation. The dynamic environments are typically induced by reaction wheels. In a lot of cases, the vibrations produced by the imbalances of the reaction wheels. And so uh, these undesirable dynamic interactions can perturb the payload instrument pointing and pointing stability. Here, an example is the Hubble Space Telescope. I invite you to Google Jitter and Hubble Space Telescope to better understand that more for that particular application. The Jitter analysis requires a very accurate finite element analysis, representations of the entire observatory structural dynamics. In order to really get a full understanding of the instrument's behavior to this to this vibration inputs caused by these imbalances in the reaction wheels. Typical modes of vibrations of interest tend to be in a thousand hertz, and the disturbance uh, environments may contain high frequencies uh, due to the wheel-induced vibrations. So it is challenging to accurately represent the dynamics of large, light, well, flexible observatories with hundreds of closely spaced, lightly damped modes. You're gonna have a lot of closely spaced modes and that's gonna complicate this type of analysis. The response of spacecraft in instruments such as optics, antennas, to on-orbit dynamic excitations 
are analyzed in a very similar way to the random vibration analysis, which is the reason I covered it first. They're caused against by these reaction wheels, mechanisms, or moving components. They're usually low energy excitations with low damping. And so to assess the performance of optics and antennas, we have to first consider a frequency response analysis. And uh, it's a very similar to the base drive random analysis, very similar to that. Typically, the spacecraft is in the free free configuration as shown here. And the disturbance inputs uh, are going to be in force units as opposed to g squared divided by hertz. So that's a big difference between the random vibration analysis I discussed earlier. The overall model damping is going to be very low, half percent, compared to other types of analysis you may perform. And various, um, you're going to also have to analyze various orientations of the, of, the, of the core spacecraft body and look at different states of propellant mass as well. So this is how you'll approach a jitter analysis. Uh, here's a jitter analysis example where you have this PSD input. And notice how these are in terms of force, squared divided by hertz, in Newton squared in this case. And you can see here that this is, uh, you have a lot of uh, oscillations, even in the PSD input. And this is what we're putting into our structure, structural model. And then as an output, you will then calculate the, um, basically the, ac the accelerations um, as the output in this case. In this case, you can also uh, plot deflections as well, which ha has been plotted. And in fact, deflections can be quite important for the optics to ensure that the, the, the uh, output deflections are not going to be uh, significant where it could cause uh, detriment to the performance of the spacecraft intentions. Here's an example of a jitter analysis methodology. In the bottom left, you're going to see a NASA TM-2018-220075. And it talks about the spacecraft microvibration, a survey of problems, experiences, potential solutions, and some lessons learned. It's a great document. There is a, a flow chart like this that talks about the interactions between um, the disturbance characterizations that needs to be performed reaction wheels, cryo pumps, solar array devices, antenna drives. And it talks about component disturbance test model for validation, model validation. And then it talks about um, the spacecraft bus models uh, and the jitter, the test data models validation. And it goes through structural model validations and all the things, all the ingredients necessary to get an accurate analysis for a jitter analysis. So I invite you to look at that paper. Now we're gonna be covering acoustics. During the liftoff in the early phases of the launch, an extremely high level of acoustic noise can surround the payload. The source of the noises are gonna be engine operation and aerodynamic turbulence. The acoustic noise are gonna be pressure waves and pinch on the lightweight, on, on lightweight panels um, that could produce high response. And so here is an example of an input uh, in terms of noise. So acoustic loads and the boundary layer turbulence are then transformed into mechanical vibrations in the launch vehicle, which can then affect the spacecraft. And acoustic loading can cause variable pressures both on the launch vehicle and spacecraft. The acoustic loads excite random base excitations in the structure, high areas with low mass structures are the more sensitive to acoustic loading. High mass structures do not respond to acoustics, but do transmit these loads to attach appendages. So it's important to really track that carefully. Because while the ma high mass structures may not be affected, they can actually transmit the loads to the appendages. Acoustic analysis can be used to predict the strength and life of large lightweight structures. And we can also predict the random vibration levels for, for the various components. The acoustic environments are typically given as a sound pressure level, which is what this is, over a range of frequencies. We also want to point out that spacecraft can be tested 
with enforced sign vibrations and acoustic test in a reverberant chamber to verify sinusoidal and acoustic specified loads. Typically, the secondary structure is subjected to these sign tests and, and random tests, and the acoustic loading environments are converted to random structural vibrations, which are then verified by the test. So light weight structures, so light structures such as solar panels, antennas, will be subjected to the acoustic test, and they're the most vulnerable. The deployable parts of the structures are usually looked at, at it from the shock loads perspective. I will be covering that a little bit later. The general random vibration analysis are specified for instruments and equipments and for very small, very stiff structures like electronic boxes. And so random mechanical loads are specified, for example, as for the Iranian 4 launch vehicle table 65, and they're valid at the base of the spacecraft. I invite you to find this information online for your own um, information so you can see how these random mechanical loads are specified. Let's go now and discuss this response spectrum analysis. So let's discuss shocks. So they're mainly caused by the actuation of pyrotechnic devices, uh, release mechanisms for stage and satellite separations, uh, or deployable mechanisms for solar arrays can cause these type of shock environments. And they're basically um, short uh, inputs that occur uh, that could cause significant amount of vibration into the structure that could be quite detrimental. Spacecraft and launch vehicle components do encounter this type of mechanical shock from a variety of sources. Uh, shock loading tends to be a rapid input of energy to a system. It can be a transient high energy and can contain frequencies up to 10 kilohertz. Shocks don't have to travel very far from the source. Uh, the components have to be tested and designed for this uh, type of shocks to ensure high reliability, especially electronic components. So consider an avionics component inside a shipping, com shipping container. If the container is on a truck which runs over speed bump at a bad speed, that's going to cause a, uh, it's going to receive some sort of pulse. It could be approximately like a half sign pulse. This type of pulse can be represented in time domain by its duration and amplitude. Here is a paper that I'd like you to download and read more. It's called the Shock Response Spectrum A Primer. And it's written by Edward Alexander. Avionics components uh, such as a spacecraft in a spacecraft will need to withstand flight shock pulses, not just transportation. Examples of that is rocket motor ignition, staging, fairing separation events, deployment events, and pyrotechnic devices. So we got to make sure these avionic components can actually survive the shock responses or inputs. So the response, the response spectrum analysis is a method to estimate the structural response to short, non-deterministic, transient dynamic events. Since the exact time history of the load is not known, it is difficult to perform a time-dependent analysis. Due to short events, random responses analysis are not really best suited for this and are rarely used, although you can use them for that. Response spectrum analysis can be used to estimate the peak response, deflections and stresses of a structure to a particular base motion or force. So the method is relatively inexpensive for pre preliminary design. It's going to be very conservative. And you're going to come up with a, you, again, you're going to extract the mode shapes and frequencies that we, we, we did in the random vibration analysis. Um, and you're going to calculate the response spectrum um, uh, or the response of the structure due to the shock input based on the mode superposition we've been discussing so far. So while calculations of the dynamic response of searchers to excitations are carried out using time domain by numerical integrations of the equations of motion, in the response spectrum analysis, that is more similar to a quasi-static analysis. The response spectrum analysis method usually is conservative compared to time history analysis. The deflection stresses and strains are determined with a response spectrum analysis and then ten, they tend to be larger in magnitude 
when you look at direct direct time integration procedures. Now that's the case because we are looking at some sort of quasi-static type response. It's going to be apparent, come apparent very clear when I discuss the theory behind it. So the response tends to be uh, is, is unlikely to be underestimated. So what is the idea? The idea of this analysis is that the shock response spectrum is a way to characterize the frequency response of a bunch, you know, think of a bunch of, of a single degree of freedom systems, a bunch of them. And all the different single degrees of freedom systems are subject to the same transient base input shock acceleration. So I'm gonna take this time domain input here and I'm gonna come up with a bunch of single degree of freedom systems and I'm gonna subject each of them to these input accelerations. And I wanna then consider um, each of these single degrees of freedom to be designed so they all have natural frequencies that vary from one value to another. And what I want to do is calculate the response of this single degree of freedom systems to this input shock environment and calculate the maximum, maximum response for each of these single degree of freedom systems. And the idea then is to construct a max on max calculation on those responses. So the single, the shock response spectrum is simply defined as a peak acceleration response. It could be either positive or negative. Uh, of a series of base excited linear single degree of freedom oscillators of different frequencies subject to that same transient base response input, uh, acceleration input, I mean. So consider a base transient shock input acceleration time history where the entire base experiences the same acceleration. We're going to then mount, so this is the base here, and we're going to take this time history, this acceleration history, and that's gonna be applied to this base. These um, single degrees of freedom have different omega ends, and that's done on purpose. And the idea now is to excite this base with these different frequencies. And I'm gonna calculate for each of these inputs an output of how this mass moves, right? And so here's an example, again, I have a base acceleration applied to this rigid base. At, in this case, I've selected six degree, discrete points, 30 hertz, 60 hertz, 200 hertz, 500 hertz, 1000 hertz, and 1300 hertz. And the idea there is then to calculate the output from, so here you have a base acceleration history from zero to 0 0.1 seconds. I'm gonna then calculate the response for an oscillator that has an omega n of 30 hertz, and this is the output I get. And then at 60 hertz, I get the output here for that mass. And then at a 200 hertz, I get that much. And again, it's calculated over the whole period of that input from zero to 0 0.1 seconds. You can see here that that's done for each of these frequencies, and I'm selecting the peak response here for each of these. Uh, omega n's, right? And so these are then plotted here. So for example, this corresponds to 30 hertz, 60 hertz, and so forth. And now I can, ca I can then produce this SRS response. Uh, so it's gonna be acceleration, G's, as a function of frequency. So this is how you do the analysis, uh, how to come up with the SRS. And this is the SRS that you'll then input into a response spectrum analysis, which in the future, if you look at the description below this YouTube, you're gonna see a link for a tutorial that walks you through that type of analysis. I wanna show you how that's done. Uh, so recall the equations of motion are given by this equation here. Um, in this case, x dot is the x is the motion of the mass, and then the base is u, the deflection u here. So there's a relative motion that impacts the spring stiffness, and that's why here you can see that we're calculating the difference. 
of these two values. If I call z to be the difference between x and u, then the equation of motion turns into this. And I'll let you look at that more carefully. But in here, u double dot is that input that I'm trying to provide uh, through this base acceleration. I also want you to notice that uh, the natural frequency and the damping can be uh, related in this manner. We already covered this. The exact solution, which I don't want to rederive right now, can be found to be this right here. And for the nth frequency, the SRS is provided by this. And so in fact, what I want to do is for the nth frequency, so that for the nth oscillator, uh, and I want to do this as continuous as possible, I want to calculate the max acceleration response here at these masses. And so I'll get that value, which is then graphed in the y-axis per each of these omega n's that we talked about. And so there are tools available that can do these calculations uh, that can work really well. So, so here's an example of a time history of acceleration here. And you can see that this has been converted into a peak acceleration input. Here's another example, which is this um, impulse here, uh, which is a half sine wave. And then this is the corresponding SRS uh, that we find. And this will be inputs into the finite element analyses uh, that can be performed to calculate the uh, absolute highest stresses and deflections. And again, you know, you could do this analysis in a time domain, but you could also simplify the analysis by selecting modes of interest and then calculating the um, response using these uh, response spectrum analysis. So the response spectrum analysis, in summary, calculates the maximum response of the structure to a transient load. It is performed as a fast alternative to a full transient solution. The maximum responses are combined to give a total response of the structure. And then we solve it using the modal superposition using the SRS. The idea is to use a modal superposition using this SRS as the input to the analysis. Uh, note how the SRS is given as a function of frequency here. Pyrotechnic shock is a shock resulting from pyrotechnic devices, which are typically an explosive or propellant activated event. Our, our power shock pulse is highly localized with high acceleration at high frequency content, and which can range from 30 to 300,000 Gs at frequencies between 100 to a million hertz, and can induce high responses. Power shock sources include explosive bolts, separation nuts, pin pullers, and power activated operational hardware. For power shock, if measurement data is not available, then you can go to this mill handbook and it will mill standard and it will provide some examples of that. So here, uh, I think what we covered is um, an approach to tackle uh, shock responses or shock inputs that are of relatively short periods. Let's cover turbine rotors now and a different application. So the application of structural dynamics in all phases of the mission of a launch vehicle can impact turbine blades, rocket nozzles, and rocket engine loads. And so what I'm gonna cover is two examples of this. Two sources of excitation that can cause uh, turbine rotors to break um, can, can be aerodynamics or the mechanical loading. We have two of them that could be a possibility. This gives the possibility of resonance to the structural member where the excitation frequency matches the natural frequency. And that can come again from aerodynamics or mechanical excitation. Here you see a turbine blade disc um, and you can have a situation where um, the flow passes through and it will cause a potential resonance condition. We have examples of this in the literature. Um, the fuel pump of, of the uh, space shuttle main engine liberated two airfoil sections of the first stage turbine blades during a test. 
inspections had shown that up to 50% of the blades in several units had cracked um, and that many of the blades had been tested up to 13,000 seconds with 21 starts. So uh, this type of thing happens a lot. And so turbine rotor analysis is quite complex and it's really important to understand the role of aerodynamics and the rotations of the rotor uh, to, to, to understand what is causing these failures to happen. Instrumented impact hammer uh, can be used to really understand uh, the response of the rotor um, to this impact. And the idea is to understand the frequency content of this rotor. Uh, this testing can validate turbine wheel models. Uh, model dynamic analysis can also be performed on this type of rotors using cyclic symmetry, and it will provide frequencies and mode shapes of these structures. If you look at down at the des description of this YouTube video, I also provide a link to a YouTube video that will guide you through the model dynamic analysis of a, a turbine uh, rotor um, structure using cyclic symmetry. So mechanical excitation is really caused by the imbalance of the forces. Uh, you could have a blade that's mistuned. Uh, the mass may be slightly different than the other ones. And so that will cause some amount of imbalance. Uh, the force varies with speeds uh, potentially and cause excitations uh, in the rota rotating machinery. The excitation frequency will be equal to the first harmonics of the rotor speed. So if the rotor speed is omega, uh, so I have omega divided by 60 times one, and I call that the first uh, engine order. Um, and then times two is the second engine order. Other harmonics will arise due to excitation frequencies that could correspond to looseness. Uh, you could have um, circumferential ovality. Uh, basically, these are caused by geometry, geometry imperfections in the system, these mechanical excitations. Aerodynamic excitation can also occur. Harmonic forcing functions result from the interaction of stationary and rotating uh, components in the flow path. Here's an example of uh, flow occurring uh, between the first stage and, and second stage stages. Uh, but vor vortices leave the blade, leaving the blade at the trailing edge of the airfoil can exert a pulsating force which could impinge onto the, onto the next stage. And that's an example shown here. The fluid can also pass through veins, and you can have discrete veins that when the fluid passes through those veins, it could cause pulsation, it can cause pulsations under the blades in a, a harmonic uh, excitation uh, approach. The number of disturbances in one revolution can produ produce excitation frequencies. So if I have 47 veins, that's going to cause excitations on the blade in a harmonic um, uh, way. So how do I determine uh, the severity of uh, these environments to the integrity of the structure? So you have a, something called the Campbell diagrams. This is nothing more than looking at the frequency content of the aerodynamic excitations and of the mechanical excitations and then determining whether those excitations can be a problem and whether those excitations can uh, couple with the uh, fundamental frequencies of the rotor and cause resonances of concern. And so it's important to understand that this could happen and the Campbell diagrams provides an approach to tackling that. You can identify the natural frequencies and mode shapes as a function of RPM. So what you wanna do is calculate uh, at zero RPM, the natural frequencies and mode shapes, uh, increase the RPMs to a higher value, map the temperatures onto the blade, and recalculate the natural frequencies and mode shapes while including the centrif centrifugal forces. Um, and in essence, you want to include the pre-stress effects in essence. You can then plot the forcing frequencies. Uh, so what you can do is plot the natural frequencies as a function of RPM first, 
then plot the forcing functions. And so the, how do you do that? So the excitation frequencies correspond, uh, say to 47 times RPM divided by 60. And so that will be in the Y axis. This value will be in the Y axis and the X axis you have RPM. So in the, in the if I have 47 veins, that's what you will do. Uh, and this is termed as 47 X in the interference diagram. You also have to plot uh, the natural frequency against the rotor speed along with the engine order lines. And so the engine order lines are given by 1x, 2x, 3x, and so forth. Again, on the y-axis, you will have Fn. In the x-axis, RPM. And n will vary between 1 and so on. So what we want to do is identify the crossings. And in this example, I have uh, one uh, engine order the second one, the third one, fourth one, fifth one. And you can actually check that this formula did work. Uh, for example, one times RPM divided by 60, that'll give you exactly what this line is. You can check it later, uh, pause the video and check it. Uh, we can also do it for the second order, third order, fourth order, and so forth. And you can then calculate the natural frequencies of the blades. Uh, in this case, the second stage blade uh, is almost constant uh, f natural frequency, so the temperatures and centrifugal forces are not causing much changes, and so the, that's the natural frequency, and it varies anywhere between 180 hertz and 215 hertz when you account for the potential variability in geometry, mass, and so forth. And so what you really have here is that uh, this frequency is crossing the first order one, and so we want to uh, prohibit this speed range because if it, I have this coupling here, I could get a resonant condition. You could also apply the 47, the issue of the aerodynamics with 47 veins, and plot 47 times RPM divided by 60. You will do so by uh, putting 47 times RPM divided by 60 on the y axis, and then RPM is the one that's varying. And then what we want to do is we want to avoid crossings against this. Uh, um, we want to avoid excitations, uh, resonant conditions. So I'm not going to go into extensive details in how to do this analysis, but I want to point you to the fact that this kind of analysis can be performed using the very concepts that we already discussed, uh, which is modal analysis. We, we talked about extracting the frequencies and, and mode shapes of the rotor. Uh, and then again, at the description of this YouTube video, I'll provide a link that you can then go there and uh, follow a tutorial in Abacus on how to do that. So it is a usual practice to check for the natural frequencies uh, by testing the blades on a shaker table. That's one approach that people use. Uh, when there are several blade ro or rows on the compressor and several, several sources of excitation, the designer is going to be confronted with a difficult task of designing the blade and the, and the guide veins rows to meet structural and aerodynamic criteria. To ensure that the blade stress levels are within the fatigue requirements of the compressor, it is usual practice to strain gauge the, bla the blades on one or two prototype machines and then to measure the stress levels and try to generate the Campbell diagrams. So these are things that you can do to improve confidence in the analysis approach. Uh, to measure data, an impeller can also be mounted on a checker table, uh, and then you can then study the uh, behavior of the system uh, when it's subjected to the checker table and compare it to the analysis. So the idea here is to try to avoid the resonant conditions. We want to avoid these crossings if we can. These crossings are resonant conditions. If you cannot avoid them, you may have to perform a force response analysis, uh, and then you're going to have to calculate the damping and use that information to determine the real stress at the root of the blades or within the rotor. You can perform additional analyses, uh, such as transient analysis or force response analysis, to then fully characterize the behavior of the structure. But the idea is to stay away from these potential crossings and not have to go to this step here. This force response analysis can be quite complex to perform. Let's give an example of a rocket engine nozzle. Failures of both nozzle actuating systems, such as the Japanese H4 engine, and sections of the space shuttle main engines 
uh, have occurred due to flow separations. Uh, there could be a shock wave system that's formed in the nozzle due to the supersonic flow uh, encountering adverse pressure gradients in the nozzle. The flow separates when the turbulent boundary layer cannot negotiate the adverse pressure gradients imposed upon it by the outer flow. And so what you have here is an internal shock. You have separation of the flow uh, from this boundary. And then you have here an example of a reattachment. Here you have an unsymmetric behavior. Um, and these are basically Mach contours are plotted for the space shuttle main engine simulation. And it shows how you could have a significant amount of flow variations within, the, uh, within this nozzle. The nozzle side loads can occur due to this asymmetry that you see here in the flow separation. And it is a result of the external pressure being higher than internal pressure. Um, and during the startup and shutdown of the engines, this rocket nozzle is operating in an overexpanded mode where the ambient pressure here is greater than the internal wall pressure acting over some portion of the nozzle. Due to that instability of the short boundary layer interaction, the flow does not occur symmetrically, and so you get these um, side loads that can occur. Uh, the finite element model of the space shuttle main engine was constructed, and it includes the nozzle, the throat, the band stiffeners, gimbal, and actuators. And then you can calculate the model dynamic analysis again to characterize the frequencies, the mode shapes. And you can see here a oval, a three pedal mode, and a four pedal mode. Uh, but you can actually uh, extract even more modes um, as well. You can then take uh, this analysis here. You can take this flow as a function of time and superimpose it uh, into a modal transient analysis. And when you do that, recall that the nozzle deformation is going to be a combination of the modes here. Um, and it's going to be an amplitude times this mode plus an amplitude times this mode plus an amplitude times this mode and so forth. And if we were to assume that uh, I'm not going to get modes greater than the four pedal shapes, then I only have three degrees of freedom and I have simplified the model quite a bit. And so if you were to perform a transient simulation, you will see bending of the structure. You're going to see ovaling of the structure. Uh, and you can then determine whether the structure can break due to these fluid transients and whether dynamic amplifications are occurring. So that's the two applications for rocket engines. Other spacecraft design drivers that should be considered uh, will be discussed. So mass acceleration curves uh, can be of great importance. They're used in preliminary design of payload hardware or equipment, or equipment items. Acceleration of physical masses of a payload are typically bounded by a curve. The lighter the mass, the higher the corresponding acceleration. So think of things attached to a payload, and so you can use Mach curves to try to design them. The lighter the mass, the higher the corresponding acceleration. That's true for both transient and random vibration anal analysis. So you can think of, uh, if I have a lighter mass, the high higher the corresponding acceleration. And so the development of such a curve is based on experience that have shown that launch vehicles in general, that when you incorporate results from the transient and random vibration analysis, that the MAC curve does very well in uh, providing a good envelope into the design this, of these ladder masses that, atta that are attached to these payloads. In most cases, a single curve can be developed for a given launch vehicle, and it can apply for a broad range of payloads. So again, these can be used very simply uh, for various structures. The idea here is if I have an appendage and I have the, it's a light mass, for example, I can then calculate how many Gs uh, I have to apply um, to the structure. And then I have to survive that quasi statically. You also have design limit loads, uh, for example, for spacecrafts that have been developed with experience. And here is uh, something like an airplane curve that kind of shows the design limit loads that need to be applied for lateral loading and for longitudinal, longitudinal loading. And so you're gonna apply for, to the spacecraft model, you're gonna be applying the static loads 
quasi-statically. Quasi Here, uh, all you see is limit load conditions. I also want to point out that uh, foldable structures experience different loads during launch than in orbit. Uh, so you have micrometeorite debris that can uh, that can occur, uh, and so you have things that are mounted on the outside of the spacecraft that could could be exposed to these uh, uh, threats. Pressure changes can be a C issue, so the absolute pressure decreases during launch and can be influenced. Uh, quite significantly. It can influence, this pressure that decreases during launch can cause things to implode or explode. Materials that normally survive on the ground uh, may be in, in peril when you're in on the on-orbit environment. Um, and so it's important to consider that. You have thermal cycling environments, radiation, contamination, humidity, and all those uh, effects need to be considered, which you did not have to consider before. Other space environments that need to be considered is vacuum, thermal radiation. Uh, you can have uh, atomic or molecular particles, magnetic fields, and gravitational fields. So uh, let's discuss vacuum a little bit. So most vacuum chambers uh, do range in this uh, arena. Uh, vacuum levels at high orbital altitudes far exceed anything that can be achieved on Earth. At low atmospheric pressures in space, Certain materials and lubricants break down and convert into a gas. We call this outgassing. Magnesium is an example of that, and that's why it's not it's hardly used in space applications. It, it can cause certain key material properties to degrade. So gases emissions can condense on lenses, mirrors, sensors. Condensation on thermal coatings may also affect thermal performance. This can be addressed by defining contamination budgets for each spacecraft subsystem and by selecting materials that have acceptable levels out of outgassing. Wet lubricants have high levels of outgassing, so, the, so they're sealed and there are proven techniques uh, to, to control it. As an example, there is an STM standard 595 that specifies testing materials at this temperature in a vacuum for this much. Uh, so for materials to pass this test, we have to see a total mass loss of less than 1% per weight. Another problem posed by space vacuum is that because spacecraft are manufactured at ambient earth pressure, any sealed structures um, can be an issue. Um, because spacecraft um, will experience, so you're gonna have pressure that gets sealed inside that will exper experience internal pressure. Um, so these pressures can generate uh, issues. You can uh, have situations where pressure gets entrapped and as a consequence, uh, as you ascend to space, uh, it can blow the fishes away. That's one possibility. You can have enclosed spaces where pressure develops and it can blow uh, things apart. So you have to drill holes in electronic boxes. You have to make sure that that pressure can escape if it's built in. Uh, in the in, in earth and then as you're saying that the outside pressure decreases So now you have all these pressure vessels that develop and so you want to make sure that things can the pressure can vent out uh, We have the situation where desorption is another class of problems where uh, can, It can occur in space vacuum uh, Polymers are used for adhesives and matrix composites tend to absorb water in a humid environment causing expansion and as in a space environment, these materials can desorb water, causing the structure to contract instead. So the waters can contaminate critical surfaces, and you can have misalignments. Thermal radiation is another area that's uh, important to consider. Spacecraft temperatures depend on internal heat generation. The heat is emitted from the spacecraft to deep into space. The heat is absorbed by spacecraft from external sources. So these are uh, situations that are important to consider. And orbiting spacecraft components have four external sources of heat, solar radiation, solar radiation from other planet surfaces, planetary emissions, and spacecraft emissions from heat generating components. So the thermal environments do pose several problems for spacecraft designers. You have non-uniform heating that can cause different materials to expand and contract at different rates, 
which can cause quite a bit of distortions and can cause problems to critical instrumentation. Stresses causing, caused by this non-uniform heating can also result in structural failure, particularly bonds between metal and composites. So it is important to understand that temperature environments can be a problem. There's a, a type of analysis that is performed and it's called uh, a structural thermal optics analysis. And that's done with the purposes of ensuring that the thermal environments in space will not cause thermal distortions onto the optics that could be detrimental for their use. Many of the spacecraft electrical and mechanical components can only work within certain temperature environments. So the purpose of the spacecraft thermal control system is to maintain the spacecraft temperatures within acceptable ranges. Uh, examples of that is using active thermal control, such as pumped liquid loops, heaters, refrigerators. You also have uh, passive thermal controls. And so those include thermal blankets and radiators. I also want to uh, kind of summarize right now the kinds of tests that you may see when you work in the launch vehicle and spacecraft industry. I've covered some of these tests already, so you can look at these as examples. But you have static testing, centrifuge testing, uh, model survey tests. Those will identify the frequencies and mode shapes uh, can also provide you damping ratios uh, that will support the couple of those analyses that we discussed. Static testing is very important as well, and that was discussed in previous lectures. You also have shaker sign vibration testing that supports uh, this verification of the spacecraft. Uh, it can help qualify secondary structures. Uh, it can help qualify uh, the spacecraft system by performing functional checks after the shake of vibration is completed. Um, you also can perform acoustic tests, which are to determine the, uh, verify and qualify the spacecraft system when it's exposed to acoustic environments that could be experienced by the spacecraft during flight. Um, you can also uh, perform shaker random vibration testing, which are really useful for electronic components that could be susceptible to failures. Uh, and you also have shock testing, which are testing this uh, to address pyrotechnics uh, and, and things like that. Um, we also covered a range of analyses, dynamic analyses, uh, eigenvalue analyses, a frequency, frequency response analyses, a direct transient analyses. We also talked about the model dynamic transient analyses and then taking a pulse uh, that represents a shock and then performing a response spectrum analysis. And then you have the random vibration analysis that was covered. So you should be able to do any of these analyses and look at the description below for uh, later for response spectrum analysis. We'll have an abacus tutorial that goes into that. And so I also invite you to take a good read at this uh, handbook here. Uh, is uh, a spacecraft mechanical loads and analysis handbook, and uh, it provides great information about a lot of the topics I covered today, uh, and can uh, also provide you a lot of background on how to approach a lot of different testing and, and analysis and things like that. So I hope you have a great day and have a rest uh, of the day being a wonderful one.